everyone. Okay, welcome to our February 13th, 2012 work session. Work sessions are an informal setting to update the council on business items. No votes will be taken during work session items on work session items. Tonight we're going to have four items on the agenda. Item number five, which was a discussion on 12540 and 12500 Arnold Mill Road and owner's purchase of sewer taps from Mountain Park, Georgia will be postponed and we'll be discussing that at our next meeting on Wednesday. Is that correct, Chris? That's next right. Wednesday. So there'll be just four items, items one through four tonight. Public comment is allowed that is germane to an agenda item. If you wish to speak, you are required to fill out a public comment card and turn it in to the city clerk staff. Public comment will be allowed for a total of 10 minutes per agenda item and no more than two minutes per person. Public comment will be heard at the beginning of each item. Once the item is called, no other public cards will be accepted. Do we have any public comment for item number one? No, sir, we do not. Okay, and I notice JB is Sam here and Bill Riley. Bill Riley is actually today. He's not free tonight. Okay. Okay, so we're you're ready to move forward. Okay, I just want to make sure. <coughs> okay, will the city clerk please sound this first item? Our first item is discussion of North Fulton County Voter Registration Initiative in the city of Milton. And tonight we have with us Ms. J.B. Reed, who's the Voter Education Specialist with Fulton County Department of Registration and Elections. all for the opportunities to be here tonight and I bring you greetings and apologies from Bill Riley and Sam Westmoreland who could not join us but uh, they're busy working on your behalf so that's good news good news um, the first thing I wanted to do was to acknowledge how supportive and helpful Mayor Lockwood and Sudie Gordon and Chris Lockwood have been and also Christine Doss um, the Department of Registration and Elections has been greeted with open arms in Milton as well as the other five cities in North Fulton County for this initiative and it has been an, an absolute pleasure working with the mayors and city administrators and clerks and we look forward to continuing this venture. So uh, as most of you know, the Department of Registration and Elections is primarily known for its work with regarding to the registration of voters in, throughout Fulton County and also for conducting the elections. But another important component of what we do is voter education and outreach. And one of the things that, that we know and it's becoming more and more apparent to us, especially as we do work here, is that voter education plus voter registration is going to equal voter participation. I wanted to share with you a, uh, an excerpt from Secretary Kemp's uh, webpage. And basically he says that as Americans, there is no right more precious than a constitutional right to elect our leaders. Yet many of eligible Georgia citizens are not even registered to vote. Um, as you know, citizens and organizations uh, throughout Georgia and particularly in the metro Atlanta area were responsible for a lot of the grassroots work as well as the national effort to pass the 1965 Voting Rights Amendment and all of the laws that came after that. And yet last year um, Newsweek magazine did a study of the last 30 years of voter registration and participation rates in the 50 states and in um, the District of Columbia. I, I regret to inform you that the state of Georgia ranked 50th. We were at the bottom in terms of voter registration and participation for the last 30 years. Unfortunately, again, um, this was supported by the fact that during the November election, only 16.1% of the voters in Fulton County actually voted. Uh, and in this most recent election, there was a state representative who won where only 367 votes were cast. Okay. I'll let that one sink in. <laughs> 
So it's, it's really sad in terms of what's happening in our county and also uh, in our state with regard to voter registration and participation. Uh, but again, I think I'll let the, the data speak for itself. Um, okay, it's kind of funny. Turn it to the back here. One of the things I wanted to share with you is some data that that we developed in, as we were trying, as the department was trying to determine how best to use our efforts this year, particularly as this is a presidential year, and more people are likely to register and to vote. Uh, so what I want to share is that is this chart of data. And if you start to the left where it says the locale, we're going to look at data regarding the state of Georgia, North Fulton County, um, I'm sorry, Fulton County, and then North Fulton County. There are six, count six cities that represent North Fulton County. Alpharetta, Johns Creek, Milton, Mountain Park, Roswell, and Sandy Springs. The next column is the population column. This is the population based on the 2010 census data. And in, for example, North Fulton County, there were 820,581 citizens uh, as, of no, as of the census being taken. And in North Fulton County, there were 349,686. The second column the adjusted population column represents, based on the census data, which says that there are 25.7% of our population in Georgia is under the age of 18, which means they are not of voting age. And so what we have there is the population minus that 25.7%, and that leaves us with an adjusted population. Okay? Uh, based on the data that the Department of Registration and Elections had, on November 1, uh, we have the active registered voters. The department also keeps track of inactive registered voters. These are voters who are registered but who have not voted in the last two national elections. So that means that they haven't voted in the last six to eight years. Uh, but they are still on the rolls. But if they don't vote in this upcoming presidential election, then they will be dropped. And the final column is our estimate of eligible voters. Uh, and that figure is a result of the adjusted population minus active voters plus inactive voters. So if you look with me, in Fulton County, there are 67,950, there were 67,959 eligible citizens who had not registered to vote. If you drop to the bottom with me, 40,397 of those estimated eligible voters reside in North Fulton cities. That is 59.1% of all estimated eligible voters are in North Fulton County. One of the things I'll remind you is that 36.4% of the county lives up here. So that is an incredible amount of people who are not registered to vote are your neighbors, and oh, I should say ours, I live in Johns Creek, um, our neighbors and family and friends and just folks we need to get to know and get them registered. Um, another 33,283 persons are inactive registered voters in North Fulton County. So there's a total of 73,680 eligible votes out there for whatever. Our goal is to get them registered. Then they have the opportunity to be educated by Milton, the other cities, other partisan organizations with regard to how they should approach different issues. But again, our goal is to see my personal goal is 75% of these folks registered and actively participating in the upcoming elections. Okay, now. now, in terms of how important is it that each of these people, each of these citizens are actually registered to vote, uh, during the 19, I'm sorry, uh, last year, during the November elections, 
only 16.1 percent of folks all over Fulton County actually voted. As I mentioned earlier, North Fulton County has 34.6 percent of the population. If half of the people in North Fulton County had voted, all of the decisions, all of the uh, all of the decisions on those issues would have gone in your favor. So there is a tremendous amount of electoral power that is not being tapped up in North Fulton County. And we need to tap in that, into that for your cities, for the county at large, and for the state. And that's why we're here today. Thank you. This is a presidential year. It's actually a tremendous opportunity to increase the number of people. Did I do that? Okay. <laughs> to increase the number of people who are registered to vote and who actually vote. Uh, the, of course, the election everybody's excited about will be the presidential election in November. But the date that I get excited about is the voter registration deadline, which is October 8th. Uh, in July, we will have the uh, presidential primary. Again, that election will happen on July 31st, but my target date is July 2nd, which is the voter registration deadline. So, um, and I'll go on and point out that the upcoming election, March 6th, the voter registration cutoff was February 6th. And what we have essentially done with the Department of Registration is approach the North Fulton Municipal Association, which is the group of six mayors who meet. And they have been, again, incredibly supportive of our initiative. And I want to take this opportunity to thank you as council members for passing the resolution last, last month that acknowledged that you all support this initiative as well. We basically divided the initiative into three parts. The first part has been focused on voter education and what uh, Mr. Westmoreland, who's our director, and uh, former Judge Riley, who's our, one of our board members and I have been doing, is meeting with the various city councils, community organizations, and uh, individuals to talk about this issue and share the information that I just shared with you. Most of them are really quiet. They just go, oh. <laughs> I kind of see the same reaction here because it is astounding. Um, the second phase of this movement will be March 7th until the July 2nd uh, deadline. And the focus there will be on actual registration. So one of the things that we're doing is meeting with all of the city uh, administrators and representatives and building a calendar of events where registration activities can occur. One of the appeals that I want to make to uh, each of the city councils and to the mayors is the importance that of your involvement. Let me say it that way. Um, we, we have encountered quite a bit of challenges in terms of finding locations for registration drives. Uh, local businesses and some of the larger businesses have not been as uh, receptive as we would have liked, and so we need your influence and assistance there. Um, a number of our churches are also uh, nervous about holding voter registration drives, even though it is a nonpartisan issue because of concerns that it would affect their 501c3 status. In fact, that is not the case because this is a nonpartisan effort and it's an educational effort and just an effort to sign up people to register. Uh, there's no attempt uh, doing our registration drives to influence or encourage folks to vote one way or the other. And the last group that we need to really reach is the community. Uh, this is an issue that we need to impress upon our citizens. So again, in each of those three areas, we're looking for your assistance to help us with that. And again, I want to acknowledge that, that Sudi and Chris Stoss have been great in terms of working with us and pulling together your calendars and uh, 
trying to come up with some activities where we can hold these registration drives, but we really need the assistance of both the faith and the business community as well. Okay, Deb. Um, so with, with that being said, the North Fulton Voter Education Registration and Participation Initiative basically is built around three Ps. The first P has to do with people. And on uh, January 11th, and um, for some counties since that time, we have held trainings for city employees to be deputy registrars as part of the uh, Voters Education and Outreach Program. And there were seven city employees, including Ms. Gordon uh, and Ms. Lagerbloom, who attended our um, launch at the Greater North Fulton Chamber of Commerce on the 11th, and it was a tremendous out. Outpouring. We had about 100 people who were trained that day to be deputy registrars who went back to their cities and are now manning registration drives at the heavily trafficked areas for customer service. The places, again, we're looking for a diversity of local venues for voter registration drives and educational programs, as well as region-wide venues. And finally is just the promotion of voter registration, education, and participation as an issue. One of the things I was really excited about was um, the local newspaper printed your passage of the resolution on the top half of the front page. That was great news, and that's the kind of publicity we're looking for. So again, we thank the media for their support. Um, and before I leave, there is one little myth I would like to dispel. Uh, and it came up in that article, and it comes up almost every time we do a presentation. A lot of people say that they will not register to vote because they'll get called for jury duty. And our response is, do you have a driver's license? And they'll say yes. And what we will tell them is that you are three times more likely to get called for jury duty because you have a voter registration. I'm sorry, because you have a driver's license than you have a voter registration card. So, again, it's... Please help us dispel this myth because we need people to register and and, um, and exercise their civic duty. So if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to try to address them. Is there any questions? Jay Ben? Ms. Reed? If not, I just uh, I want to thank you for your time and coming here and we've oh, enjoyed absolutely. working with you. And uh, as you mentioned, we have passed a resolution in support and uh, the council has. So. Yes. Anyways, it's, uh, but uh, offer a lot of insight. It's uh, it's amazing when you think about the number of people that uh, are is. eligible that don't vote, and uh, right. that's a good point. With North Fulton could be a major decision maker if everybody got out there and uh, was eligible to vote and voted. Exactly. That's right. So. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Then. Well, thank you very much, and I want to encourage you to check your mailboxes in the next two to three weeks. There'll be something special, and we hope that you will say yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Before we move on to our item number two, is there any public comment? Okay. No, sir. You just sound that item. Discussion of ARC Green Communities Certification. This is being presented by Michelle McIntosh Ross and Ms. Cindy Ede. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the Council. Um, I, I uh, just want to give you a little background in that um, approximately a year and a half ago, um, staff from community development came before you to describe the ARC Green Communities Program and asked you at that time if you wanted them to proceed with um, an application uh, leading to certification of Milton as a green community. And at that time you gave them the green light and told them to proceed. So um, Michelle McIntosh Ross, um, a planner in community development, as well as Cindy Ede, the city sustainability coordinator, are here to give you an update to, to describe first the program for, for the new council members to re, and to refresh the rest of you, and then to give you a status report in terms of where they are and where they hope to go by May 25th, which is this year's um, 
application deadline for the Green Communities Program. So with that, um, Michelle and Cindy. Good evening. I am Michelle McIntosh Ross with uh, Community Development. Um, just like Kathy said, I came in front of you July of 2010 to talk about the Green Communities Program that ARC had. Um, through. Um, tonight I'm going to do an overview again for those of you who need to be refreshed um, as well as inform the new council members about that. We're going to talk about the progress to date as well as the work that we have been doing. Excuse me. And um, we want to talk about your involvement as a council in this initiative. The Atlanta Regional Commission launched this Green Communities Program back in 2008, and their goal is to um, promote and encourage local governments to um, consider sustainability in their decisions and policies and plans. Um, they hope to promote environmentally sustainable policies throughout the region. Um, it is intended to reduce the region's impact on the environment. Um, this program is a voluntary program and it recognizes the governments that are taking steps to reduce the overall impact on the environment. Some of the benefits to being an ERC green community is that it fosters civic pride. It provides a positive image of a place to live and to conduct business. Um, it sets an example for businesses and residents and organizations seeking to reduce their environmental impact. It also gives the city some accountability to ask businesses and residents to be more efficient and more sustainable in their own um, lives and businesses. Uh, it also leads to a greater quality of life. We're going to switch out in between. Switch out. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm Cindy Ede, Sustainability Coordinator. I'm very happy the city has decided a um, year and a half ago to work on um, being a green community. I think we have so many wonderful things to offer here in Milton, and I think it will just be great for the region, for all the cities in North Fulton to uh, be on board. Um, see if I can work this, since I haven't done this before. Okay. Um, here we go on the, the different cities that are members of the Green Community Certification already, and we have some of our sister cities up there. Um, as you can see, Alpharetta has received the gold certification. That's the highest level. Um, Roswell is in the silver category. Um, Sandy Springs and Johns Creek are not in there yet, so I think we're going to beat them to the punch there. Um, so there's three gold cities, there's four silver cities, and then there's nine combination of counties and cities that have applied since 2008 and gotten that certification. The way the certification works is that the ARC gives us a um, 65 different measures that we can apply for. They're all in this green certification book. And they're more specific than what we're going to get into with you tonight. But this is available if anybody's interested in seeing the level of detail involved in each of these measures. The measures um, account for five to ten points uh, per, per area. So when you see that the lowest level is 175 points for bronze, you need a lot of different measures to add up to that 175. Michelle made a great start in getting us to a level of 85 already, um, where she has documentation on all of that. Um, but we're go going to need at least another 90 points to get to that, um, to the bronze level. Okay. Oops. I'm sorry. I think I switched back there. So real quick, um, I'm going to just go through um, what we have done uh, so far already, just some examples. Um, for those who were here, you can recall that back in um, 2010, you gave the go-ahead on pursuing the green communities, and um, we've been able to, for certain, 
count 85 points. We went down to ARC um, in January, and um, we showed them what we had so far, and they sort of signed off on 85 points so far that we definitely have. Um, like Cindy said, we need at least 175 to even get to the bronze. Um, so some examples of ones that we have already that we've got the sign off is, for instance, uh, number 15, we have an ordinance to operate outdoor lighting more efficiently. That's our night sky ordinance. So that accounts for five points. Um, uh, the next three, um, we were informed that we get those because um, that's through the Fulton County's um, water district. So we've got 15 points, additional points that we didn't know we had. So that was a good thing. And then, um, as you can see, the Tree USA, we are a Tree USA city, so we have um, another five points there. And um, we also implemented a recycling program for traditional recycling materials and so on. So those are some examples of some of the points that we just know that we definitely have. And we also have a, a, some other points that we're pretty sure that we'll get. Uh, and we're pretty sure that we'll get those by May. And so that's why we're confident this year that we'll be able to turn in an application to get at least a bronze. And so Cindy will take you through some of those that we feel are low-hanging fruit. So uh, we do have handouts if anybody would like to have a list of all the things that we already have achieved and then a list of the things that we are working on. But just, just to give you an idea of a couple of the things we're working on. OK. Um, and they relate to 115 points. Um, we're going to be conducting energy and water audits at all three fire stations, and we've talked to Chief Edgar about that. Um, he's totally um, in favor of doing that. Um, he's already done and in implemented some energy efficient moves in the uh, fire stations, but um, these are going to be um, done by the energy provider, which happens to be Sawney and Cobb Energy EMC. Um, and they're going to come in and, and just take a look at what we have and make suggestions. Um, ARC isn't interested in the city spending a lot of money to, to get to this level. They'd like us to implement low or no cost options. Um, so we're going to see what we have and we're going to see, um, you know, if there's, if there's things that we can do that will make a difference that won't cost the city a lot of money. The same thing in the water area as well. Um, we're going to install um, rainwater systems, which is just going to be a simple rain barrel at each of the water stations, excuse me, fire stations. And um, you might say, well, gee, what do they need that for? That landscaping is all um, pretty, pretty well um, in good shape and, and um, mature, so it may not really need a lot of water. We're thinking about implementing a adopt-a-station uh, type of concept that will be similar to our adopt-a-road, where community groups will adopt a fire station and take care of planting seasonal flowers for them to beautify the station and beautify the community um, on a yearly basis um, at their cost. And um, so they'll be able to use that, the rain barrels to do that watering for those, those plants. <clears throat> and then um, we instituted an adopt a commute option program with the Clean Air Campaign. And I have a, um, a poster over here of one of the things that um, they have come back with um, by giving them a list of our employees only, only by number, not by name, in their home address. We're able to really map where everybody lives and be able to see if there's some opportunities for people to ride share, to work together. Um, whether it's once a week or several times a week and um, help to defray the cost of, um, of all the, the gasoline and, and the uh, carbon imprint that they're, they're leaving with that. So uh, we're working closely with them. Um, there's a lot of things to consider because um, with, the, with the safety people and needing, needing their vehicles or in some cases leaving their vehicles at other places um, and driving in, um, it might be a challenge, but we are taking a look at that and trying to come up with a way that it may be, um, be able for us to, to use that clean air commute. <clears throat> so our next steps are, um, we're going to continue to work, and this is a lot of people in, on the staff working on the Green Communities initiatives over the next several months. Um, we'd like council to consider doing something similar to what Alpharetta has done, and I put that in your packet. Uh, where they have an ordinance 
um, considered a green ordinance, and a lot of cities have done this, this type of thing. And they're rolling in all of the components of their environmental sustainability into one document so that we don't have to make a document for our purchasing policies and for if we decide to do green building standards, that kind of thing, we can put it all in one document. So we included that Alpharetta one. We have samples of other ones if you'd like to see that. Not right now, but at some other time. And so uh, we're, we're taking a look at that, and we'll, um, Michelle and I will work on trying to word that so that it um, pertains exactly to the, the initiatives that we're going to be working on, because Alpharetta has achieved a gold level, so they have a lot of, a lot of things on here that we're not going to actually be doing. But that's just to give you a sample of that. Um, our Green Community Submission date is May 25th. The nice thing is we can continue to work on the initiatives after May 25th up until the end of October. So we don't have to have it all done now, but they have to see that we have work in progress and we're moving in the right direction. Um, the awards would be presented the fourth quarter, usually December, so 2012. So we hope that we're going to be galloping off here for the bronze very soon already done a lot of work and we hope that um, that you all will continue to support what we're doing and um, if we need need help with the ordinance um, we'll be coming back to you we do have sort of a schedule of how we're going to be doing that uh, presenting it to the Planning Commission at the end of February um, and then a work session with the Planning Commission uh, Planning Commission's regular meeting in April and then it would be on the council agenda in early May and then a meeting in late May. So we're on kind of a tight schedule uh, timing wise to get that green ordinance done um, in order to be able to submit that by May 25th. But we know we can do it. Are there any questions? Or would anybody like to have one of the handouts of the measures that we already have accomplished or are planning to accomplish? They're available if you need them. Any questions? Any questions, Bill? Bill. Yeah, maybe a question about Alfred and Roswell since they yeah. got what gold and silver. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have access to their score sheet to see specifically what they have done? What we do. Done? I actually have it here if you'd like to see it. Um, yes, it's a you know it isn't a detailed score sheet, but it does show all the different measures that they. They did get awarded their gold and silver level for. And both of those cities have um, decided that they want to have the green building standards in their ordinances, where their cities uh, have made the commitment to uh, build uh, any, new ex any new buildings to the LEED standards or to the Energy Star standards. So in those building areas, you do get a lot of points. And uh, that jumped them up, probably Roswell, up to silver because they were able to capture a lot of points in the building area. Um, we are taking a look at those kind of sustainable measures in our new public safety building, but we haven't made the decision that we want to spend the money necessary to get that LEED certification. But Carter is definitely looking at it with the designers. Okay. Uh, Bert? Is this something that, so we go on at bronze that we can continue to try to step up the ladder and is that is that how some of the other communities absolutely yes I'm not sure that the other communities started at a lower level since this is a new program you might have jumped right into what they are now but you definitely have the opportunity to move you know move up the ladder and go to silver or gold down the road yep yes mm -hmm. oh. um, the same way that every year you could move up you can also move down Atlanta was a higher one in previous years and they will they move down to bronze because sometimes the folks don't keep up with some of the initiatives so you yeah. have to be mindful of that. Lance? Yeah. Uh, you I guess answered one of the questions was with new facilities um, <clears throat> instead of actually getting a certification but incorporating actual lead and green principles into new construction which I've been involved with I'm sure Councilman Lusk and Lockwood, Mayor Lockwood, have been involved with buildings such as that, where you actually don't go through the commissioning and, and certification. Do you get credit for 
Well, unfortunately, no, you don't. It's something that they might consider changing. But um, we can definitely get a lot of our own press out of that kind of thing to show the community what we've done. But it doesn't look like we'll be able to get any points from ARC on that. It would have to be one of the standards. Yes, get a certification at some level yes. as a LEED certified it's either, building program. Either LEED or Earth Star Light uh, Craft Commercial. Right. Mm -hmm. One of those. Okay. Okay. I have, yeah, I, have, I have a question. Um, yep. A little bit about more about ARC itself. Mm -hmm. um, how are they promoting these cities from that standpoint in their own marketing, et cetera? And how do other people who may be wanting to move to residences want to know about this program? That's that's a good question. I don't know exactly how to answer that. Michelle might be a little more familiar with that. Well, you, you want to know how they promote it? Yeah, I mean. Um, well, I mean, they send letters out to the cities every year letting them know that the um, applications are due, and they also offer um, classes um, that um, staff uh, could attend to see how they can um, implement these measures. Um, they put it in their... Um, Leaflets for any type of classes they have, they always mention it's all over their website as well. Um, I'm not sure uh, beyond, above that what else they do as far as um, residents, but I know for local governments they do promote it to any meetings we go to. There's somebody who gives an update okay. on the green communities. So. But they don't do anything in like the AJC or, or promotion in magazines or things like that as far as announcing the cities. I thing. think that I've seen it in the paper sometimes, okay. like when, I remember when Alpharetta got gold, it was in the paper. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Lance? Has, has oh, probably more, uh, has GMA uh, gotten involved with this mm -hmm. as far as they would be someone that would maybe promote, publicize that type of thing, mm -hmm. and also the chambers as well, if, you know, if you're certified that way as the chamber promotes an yeah. area and I think well, each but, uh, city. the GMA is involved with this? Well, I'm not sure how much the GMA is involved. I, 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 don't, I just don't know. Um, but I do know that each city promotes that. Once they become some sort of level, they promote it mm -hmm. um, on their website, and they really boast about it, uh, too, because, you know, I've had some of our North Fulton neighbors, you know, letting us know that they're on the list. And I think that would probably that. be a good thing if, if GMA were to get you know, on board, mm -hmm. they have a, a yeah. periodical publication that they come out with. I would like to, I mean, ARC gives the guidelines, but I'd love to push back on them saying, hey, we got there, you know, now let's promote Milton from that standpoint to say, we did this, what are you doing as well to show that their efforts are paying off by telling other people about what we've done? Mm -hmm. I'd love to see, just ask the question to them at some point, if we ever have that communication with them. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll check and see exactly to what extent they do promote. I know that um, their own goal is to have, and I don't know where they are in terms of accomplishing this, but they really wanted the entire ARC region to be a green region, and I don't know if they're pushing to be the first uh, regional agency to do that. You know, I don't know, but I know they're really um, offering so much help to get all of their uh, agents, the local governments in the um, jurisdiction to be green. Okay. Anybody else? Well, thank you, Michelle. Thank okay, you, Cindy, absolutely. very much. This is exciting. So everybody's coming for good. This is something we need to uh, make sure it's publicized. So okay. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm going to move on to item three. Do we have any public comment? Yes, sir, we have three. Okay. Our first one comes from Mimi Sullivan. My name is Mimi Sullivan, and I live on Bethany Way. And I've lived up in this area for 16 years, and I do happen to have a horse farm, but it's just a personal horse farm. It's just our own horses. Um, and I have been participating in the Milton Horse Council for about the last year or so. And first of all, I'd like to say that we are absolutely delighted that Milton as a city has decided to look at the uh, regulations that are on the books and considered opening up uh, the land use to having barns and uh, riding rings in front of homes. And 
I know just personally, I know a lot of people who live here who have bought larger tracts of land, 10, 20, 50 acre properties. And the house may have already been built on the back side of the property years ago for some reason, either because it was the tallest um, part of the land or because maybe it was wooded, um, but just mainly from the topography of the land. And then perhaps the flatter areas or the cleared areas happen to be in the front part of the property. And so as people have moved in and have wanted to create some really nice horse farms with some real quality horses and good trainers and a, a, you know upstanding facility, their problem has been that they don't have enough land behind the house to be able to build a barn or to be able to build a riding ring. And uh, we've heard that complaint from several people and they've chosen not to purchase land or not to move a facility here because the house was already located at the back of the property. So we just love the fact that you all are looking at this and um, considering being able to put barns and put riding rings in front of homes. I know on my property, I have 11 acres. We built our house on a hill. Um, it's the highest point. I have kind of a ravine in front, and then I have very flat areas. Um, and so we built our house in the back part up on a hill, but then, you know, and considering where to put the ring, you want to put a ring in the flat area. So a lot of times the flat area is in front of the house. So, you know, we struggle to be able to keep it behind that front plane of the house. Um, and fortunately, we were able to do it. But I think it's been a problem for other people. So I'm just delighted that you all are looking at this. Um, I was looking at the table here that you've provided. And um, I want to say that I support the staff recommendation for um, the covered riding areas and the lit riding areas, whether it's covered or uncovered, being considered on a case-by-case -case basis. I think it's very hard to come in carte blanche and say anybody who wants to can just build it in front of the house. I think you have to be realistic and look at how much property are we talking about, what are the setbacks, um, how will it impact the neighbors and surrounding communities. So I think it's good to consider all of that. And I'm glad that they have. I guess one of my concerns is when you say you allow it with a use permit, what would be the criteria for a use permit? You know, somewhere I'm guessing that y'all are going to establish what those criteria are. And I would be very interested in looking at, you know, what are the different kinds of hoops, so to speak, that people would have to jump through to be able to be eligible for a use permit. And one of my other questions is just so in this document you stated domesticated animals. And I guess is there a definition somewhere of what a domesticated animal is? Um, I know, you know, a horse and a dog and cat are domesticated animals. I don't really know what other animals it would open that up to when you just say domesticated animals. So I wonder if Milton has a list somewhere of what is considered to be a domesticated animal. And that's, you know, more just out of kind of criteria, um, curiosity and making sure that someone is following your guidelines. Um, and I think... That basically was all of my concerns. I'm just really thankful and very appreciative that y'all are willing to look at this. Um, I'm delighted that you're considering covered arenas, um, and I think it's appropriate to consider them on a case-by-case -case basic because along with covered arenas usually comes a little larger crowd, a lot of times lighting. Um, you might need more parking. So I think it's a good idea to look at, you know, where would that be appropriate. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next comment comes from Laura Bentley. Hi, I'm Laura Bentley, 2500 Bethany Church Road. Um, in November of 2010, Jack Flowers and I introduced to you all the Milton Horse Council. And this is a group of equestrians, um, trainers, large operations, small operations um, here in the city of Milton um, that have come together to try to organize ourselves as stakeholders um, within the city. Um, one of, at our first meeting we identified um, several goals and those are um, to influence land use within our city um, to preserve and promote equestrian operations and also provide feedback to the city council and staff on how to better accommodate equestrian operations here. 
Um, so our first meeting, um, we organized our second meeting, I believe uh, Chris Lagerbloom w attended, and um, one of the main things that we talked about was the inability for um, barns to be located in front of um, homes. This is a huge deterrent to flipping over properties that are very attractive to for equestrian use. A lot of people come in and look at the property and then determine that they might not want to take that risk with the city. Um, so we, as the Horse Council, are, are very happy to see this come forward tonight for your consideration. And um, we hope that you will um, consider putting barns in front of dwellings. I know the Planning Commission worked really hard on the wording, and um, we appreciate their hard work along with staff uh, really taking our input and, and trying to pr improve this. I think it's a really simple thing that we can do to try to make um, many properties of, within our city remain equestrian oriented. Thank you. Thank you. Our final item speaker is George Ragsdale. George Ragsdale, 540 Treburn View in Milton. Um, <clears throat> I've got several comments. First, and, and for those of you that are not new to the council, a lot of this is going to be repetitious. Uh, for those of you that are, it's, it's going to be new. But first co comment really has to do with the process. Um, what you have in front of you tonight is, is uh, several pieces of information that I will try to relate to as best I can. One of, those, one of them is a recommendation that's titled Planning Commission's Recommendations with City Attorney's Comments. One is titled uh, Planning Commission's Recommendations, excuse me, Staff's Recommendations with City Attorney's Comments. And the third uh, document is the chart that uh, was just referenced a minute ago that looks like this. Um, prior to uh, actually tonight, nobody in the Planning Commission has ever seen this document. Uh, as a matter of fact, I had Paul Moore not forwarded it to me, uh, I wouldn't have seen it before tonight either. So this is a, a summary of what is supposedly uh, the three um, states, if you will, that you're being asked to consider, current zoning, the Planning Commission's recommendation, and staff's recommendation. I will tell you that this is, a, a, in my opinion, somewhat misleading. It doesn't talk about the process that's required in each case. Um, our recommendation from the Planning Commission uh, we think is consistent with what is, is best for Milton. With respect to animal barns, as Ms. Bentley said, we think that having horse barns uh, in, the, in the front of property is a good idea, provided that the property is sized properly to do that. One of the differences you'll see is that in the staff recommendation, there's no minimum acreage for that. In ours, it's a 10-acre minimum, which is what's there now. Um, we just spent a lot of time trying to distinguish between what we call a riding arena and a riding area. A riding area we think is much more uh, compatible than having a riding arena. A riding arena implies a, a big structure with possible lighting and bleachers. We tried to distinguish those. We don't think that it's appropriate to have lighting, lighted, uh, seated arenas, covered arenas or otherwise, in front of, of properties. Uh, again, with the possibility on a case-by-case -case basis. Nothing that we recommended precludes any of that. It just proposes a different process for getting approval. It relaxes the process to go to staff's recommendations so that it becomes less visible of what those changes are. And that's really the primary change between the two. But my concern, as I said in the beginning, is, is at least in part with the process. Um, this started back in, in uh, January. We, we reviewed it in January. We made a recommendation. Um, on the 27th of January, there was a, a letter sent out to the, the council for your meeting on the 6th of February that included with it two versions of, of the proposed ordinance, one as labeled tonight, one staff, one uh, planning commission. We'd never seen either of those before the night they were sent out on the 27th. We've never seen the final text of the ordinance that we voted on when we met back in uh, January. Um, the other thing I would point out is that the ordinance that was sent out to you 
uh, on the 27th in both cases had comments from the city attorney, none of which had we seen before, none of which had we had any opportunity to understand. The versions that are in front of you tonight are not the same versions that were sent out on the 27th of January. They have different comments from the city attorney than what was sent out in January, all of which is just going to the point that, you know, if, if the process that we've established is going to work, we've got to try and use it. And, and we feel, as we have many times in the past, that our value is being diminished, if not eliminated, by having these things go through us as a planning commission, making a recommendation, and then having what comes before you be materially altered from what we had proposed. Certainly, if there's an alternative recommendation, by all means, you guys should consider that. But we would at least like the respect to say that what's put in front of you as our recommendation is something that we have seen, voted on, and passed. Thank you. Okay, is that all a public comment? Okay, if the city clerk would call this next item. Our next item is discussion of RZ 1201 to amend Article 6, Division 2, AG 1, Agricultural District, as it relates to allowing structures, housing animals within the front yard, and fencing along public right of ways. Ms. Kathy Field. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Thank you. Uh, we have two uh, modifications to the ordinance, uh, and I've identified them as issue one and issue two, so I'd like to put them both out um, uh, for discussion and then um, uh, go back and, and in detail to discuss each issue. So the issue one um, is a proposal to modify the allowed location of barns and covered riding areas in the AG1 districts when the property is being used primar primarily for either residential or non-residential purposes. And we define non-residential as, as not having a, a house, obviously, on the property, um, where the residential, the, the, the main use would be the house. Um, and you, if you want to think about it as res non-residential as being a commercial type farm, that's probably pretty close to, I, I think, the, the sense of that non-residential definition. And um, currently, the, the, the minimum for, for the non-residential is a minimum of 10 acres. That's how our ordinance s s speaks to it. It, is, it has to be over 10 acres. It doesn't address below 10 acres. So uh, the discussion is that in parcels that are used primarily for residential use, barns and covered riding areas must be placed behind the primary residential structure. Parcels that are used primarily for non-residential purposes with a minimum of 10 acres do not have any restriction aside from standard setback requirements as to location of these structures. Um, and we feel that the current ordinance uh, really perceives us to be non-equestrian friendly, and this is an attempt to resolve that issue. The second issue that we would like to talk about tonight it relates to fencing, and that um, the pro proposal the proposal is to re require the equestrian style three or four board fence along the public right of way within the AG1 district. Currently, the way the, the zoning is written, only non residential and commercial properties within the Northwest Overlay Zoning District. Now, the Northwest Zoning Overlay District really covers pretty much our, all of our AG1. So, only the, the non residential commercial properties are mandated to have the three or four board fences. So, residential uses are not included. In order to enhance the equestrian look and ambiance, it is proposed that this requirement extend to all properties regardless of use that are zoned AG1. So without this proposed change, opaque fences or walls are allowed in the AG1 district. So this is an attempt to um, minimize those requests for opaque uh, fences or walls and to really bring um, all properties along public right-of-ways into conformance with the equestrian style fence. Now back to issue one in terms of the barns. Um, I, and I, I did provide you all with a breakdown of, of a chart because it does get a little complicated, but I, I'm going to run through this and then we can speak at the end from the chart. But the current zoning regulations in terms of 
The current zoning regulations in terms of residential use um, allows barns housing domesticated animals. So more than horses, goats, sheep, llama, whatever. Um, they're, they're allowed in the rear or side yards um, with minimum setback rear and side yard requirements, obviously. Um, in terms of riding areas uncovered, they're allowed in anywhere, rear, front, and side yards. In terms of covered, based on the size of the parcel, the structure cannot exceed 25,000 square feet and are only allowed in the rear or side yard. So that's our current re regulations for residential. For non-residential use, and again, it's a minimum of 10 acres. This is how the ordinance speaks to this. Uh, barns for domesticated animals are allowed in front, rear, and side yards. Riding areas uncovered allowed in front, rear, and side yards, and covered also allowed in front, rear, and side yards. Again, over 10 acres. This issue was brought to the Planning Commission, and they did uh, uh, submit the following recommendations for this. Um, for all parcels, with or without a single-family residential <coughs> use as the primary use, and again, in the non-residential, a minimum of 10 acres again, they're allowed in the front yard, barns, structures, but only for horses, no other domesticated animals, and they allow in the front yard also uncovered riding areas. And then they recommend um, the following uses to be prohibited in the front yard. Uncovered riding areas with lights and or bleachers and all covered riding areas with or without lights and or bleachers. The, the, the staff did review this as well and felt that they wanted to issue uh, their own set of recommendations to, to, to deal with some of, of these issues. and. Um, we recommended that for parcels with or without, and again, the without, the, the non-residential, with no minimum acreage for the non-residential, um, th that the following be allowed. In the front yard, barns and structures housing domesticated animals and uncovered riding areas. So that would be allowed by right. However, um, if you wanted to put in either the front, rear, or side yard, through a use permit. Now, a use permit is different than a variance, as you know. It doesn't require a hardship, but it does require us to look on a case-by-case -case basis at each application. We would allow, through a use permit, uh, the following uses. Covered riding areas, lighted riding areas, whether they be covered or uncovered, and designated seating structures for viewing, covered or uncovered. And so we, we felt that the increased intensity of uses um, allowed by the use permit would um, it, it was a, we thought it would be a good balance in that um, it could be allowed if, if, if the conditions were appropriate. And um, so uh, rather than having an outright prohibition. So having said that, uh, you have your chart, which I know is fairly unreadable on the slide up here, unfortunately, but you should have a, the, the, the blue and white colored chart. And it does break down. Um, by each of the uh, uh, recommendations in the current regulations, what is allowed, so that you can have some sense. Uh, it, it does get a little confusing, so we, we, ho we hope that this chart uh, makes it clearer for you. So, so that is the uh, recommendations put forward. Um, as you know, the, um, the policy that, that we do follow is that our city attorney, Paul Frick, is here, who did re re review both the planning commission recommendations um, and also review the staff recommendations to make sure that they were in conformance with um, any legal issues. So he is certainly here to, to respond as well to questions, as is staff. So with that, Mr. Mayor. Okay. We'll open it up, start with some questions. Anybody have any questions for staff? Bert? <clears throat> with the, um, on this first one on the chart, the, um, the barns in the front, with the staff recommendation um, of basically all domesticated animals. Well, couldn't somebody use that and like have a dog kennel or something in their front yard? Uh, Paul, do you want to respond to that? Uh, as, as it's written, uh, I would say it's probably an argument looking at the definition domesticated animals 
it, it would appear to be uh, covered under that definition as it's set in the code right now. Okay. That can be, that specific term can be modified to limited or expanded as, as large or small as the council wishes. Okay, because to me that would be something that would be kind of unattractive to have that kind of thing in your, in your front yard versus, I can certainly see how a, you know, a difference in horses or livestock type things versus mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I take that question, you know, one step further, too. Um, I can certainly see why the Planning Commission had uh, uh, recommended horses only, although there is other livestock in a equestrian area or an agricultural area. And is that, Paul, you know, are we, uh, uh, you know, just singling out one animal and not allowing, it, allowing another, you know, other things being prejudiced towards other Type of livestock, or is there any problem with that? Uh, I th there's no equal protection <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 for, for the animals. Pig, all pigs are equal, none are more equal than others. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think you, th there are relevant reasons to consider each animal differently. Okay, so. George, do you have a comment? Do you want to step up? <clears throat> Sorry, as, as usual, it's hard to sit in the back of the room. Um, the the current ordinance already provides for a kennel or a veterinary hospital or a veterinary clinic as a permitted use, so this doesn't change that. The other thing is it provides, to Mayor Lockwood's point, it provides for agriculture, general and specialized farming, including uh, greenhouse, dairy farming, livestock raising, poultry raising. It, it, the, the addition is domesticated animals as opposed to other agricultural animals, which are already included in the ordinance and are not being taken out. Karen? It looks like what staff is recommending really is a little bit broader, but it does require a use permit. So it's not saying we prohibit anything. It just says we want to look at it on a... On a um, case-by-case case basis. That's right, without um, having to prove a hardship, because right now the only way if, uh, if someone uh, wanted to put a barn in the front is they would have to, and, and we have had applications in the past where uh, a, an owner would go to the, to, to, to the BZA to request a variance. But uh, again, it's a harder, hardship. Uh, it's a hardship, as opposed to a special use permit, which says, yes, it's allowed, but on a case-by-case, case, which means that we want, want to look at it to make sure that there are and no. And in that case, the staff would make a recommendation. It would come before the council to, to approve the use permit each time. Yes. To me, that just makes a lot more sense than just saying no. If we, what we really want is to promote the equestrian area. <coughs> Bill? I think to Ms. Sullivan's uh, question there about uh, definition of domesticated animals, um, it's probably going to come up down the road uh, when somebody comes for a special use permit. Do you think it's, it's proper at this time to identify? Uh, certainly I wouldn't want a herd of peacocks out in front of somebody's house. <laughs> That's, um, Maybe something you can either ride or eat. I will say the, the term the term is defined in the code uh, in mm -hmm. code of ordinances under the animal section um, as any animal fowl domesticated by humans so as to live and breed in tame conditions for the advantage of humans. Oh, wow! Uh, Who cares? So a sheep could be would easily be a domesticated animal if you're getting the wool off of it and using it for your. Sheep actually also falls under livestock, which is also under the agricultural uses. Uh, How about like it's, it's llamas and alpacas and emus, braying ducks. All other animals used or suitable for either food or labor is under the livestock definition. As well, um, Joe. Yeah. Um, first of all, uh, you know, as always, there's been an awful lot of work done on 
trying to get our hands around these things. I think this represents a lot of really good progress. The concern that I have, um, Kathleen, you said that you guys looked at the Planning Commission recommendations and decided that there needed to be maybe some massaging of that uh, or some adjustments to the language that they'd used. Uh, yeah, I, I think our thought was to, uh, we, we felt that an alternative set of recommendations um, could be proposed that was less onerous than, than that and in, in that it could allow uh, for, for some uh, allowance for, for uh, more conditions where you could have a barn or a riding area in the front, but with a control in place being the, the use permit, which is less onerous than the variance, which is the only way that would be open under the planning Commission recommendations for for the prohibited. It would have to go the variant variance route. Yeah, and and you know we got two copies of this, and you know we routinely get two copies of things, and we start talking about uh, these types of, of changes. So, was there a point when you talked to the planning commission about maybe what you guys came up with, what you thought about? Did you ask them about their um, their rationale or their motivation to do things or word things a specific way? Well, we were at the meeting, so so oh. we, we did talk to I mean, we, we were well, part was, of the discussion. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, because yeah. I was thinking there was some kind of disconnect between what the Planning Commission was saying and what the staff was saying, and, and I was just trying to, uh, you know, we should have a goal sometime this year having one of these things come before us without some of the uh, seeming frustration that, 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 that it generates. So I was just more worried about that than anything yeah. else. I, yeah. I certainly appreciate all the effort that went into both versions of this. Mm -hmm. I mean, the way I'm reading it is, step you're basically taking uh, the uh, Planning Commission's, um, their work, and you were adjusting it to um, your recommendations, correct? So yeah. It's, it wasn't separate than Planning Commission's recommendations, it was just tweaking of theirs? That's, that is correct, that is correct. Um, I, I have a question too, and um, George, feel free to comment on this. Um, the staff is recommending no minimum acreage, and Planning Commission is recommending a minimum of 10 acres. Um, what's the reasoning behind that, the 10 acres? Again, the 10 acres is only on the, when you get into a riding arena. We didn't propose, uh, um, I, I take that back, we did propose 10 acre minimum, I think, across the board. The, the reason is we can't control the size of what's being proposed. We don't know how big the barn's going to be. We don't know how big the riding arena is going to be, the riding ring's going to be. Um, we thought that if we were going to relax this and allow, by right, people to build those, without any constraint or any controls on how big it was going to be, that it ought to be at least a 10-acre minimum so that the, um, the setback requirements, when they were met, would keep it more transparent to the community and it wouldn't be visible from the community. You know, if you remove that, you could theoretically, again, by right, with no use permit required, build that barn on a one-acre parcel right out in front of the house if that's what you wanted to do. That's what this would allow. And we were trying to at least bring that up to a point where if you had that small a piece of property, again, it doesn't say you couldn't do it. It just said you would have to come through a process and get it approved to make sure it was compatible with surrounding uses and so on. It, it clarify, the, uh, the barn, the barns are in front. On residential, um, you have the 10-acre 10, 10 minimum also, mm -hmm. as well as the non-residential. Right. It's already allowed in, in uh, um, the, the non-residential is already allowed. We didn't change that. That's what's allowed under the ordinance right now. Okay. I guess my only comment with that, and I certainly understand when you use the one acre example, but, uh, you know, it's as time goes on, it's harder and harder to find 10 acres plus parcels of property, and you see a lot of, you know, little mini farmettes of, you know, three, four, five acres that, might want to do a small barn and, and you know, have some horse hay. Hey, again, though, that, that 10 acres is for non-residential use. If where the primary use is residential, the 10-acre minimum doesn't apply. Okay, that was my question yeah. before, and that's why yeah. I had asked. And, you know, misunderstood that. Then. Mayor. Um, speaking towards this 10-acre minimum and such, uh, could there be some mechanism other than minimum acreage 
a uh, floor area, something like a floor area ratio or coverage ratio. That would help regulate uh, Mr. Rashdale's uh, point in terms of, you know, no minimum acreage and having something built uh, on a very small parcel. Well, I, I, I guess our response would be that's, that would be why the, the, the use variant, the, the use of permit right. would be, you know. Right. Uh, so we could look at it in a case by case. In some cases, if, if there's no one, or, you know, if, if there's no development around or there's a church on one side and there's something else, I mean, it, it really, you really have to look at each case. And uh, I'm not sure, Robin, if you want to jump in, but... I just want to make a little correction, at least from the way we interpret it, was that in the situation where you have 10 acres, what we looked at was, I think there was a problem with, let's say, what Mayor Lockwood was starting to say, what if you bought seven acres and you wanted to put a barn on it and put some pastures on it? According to this, you couldn't do it. So that's why we took away the 10 acres from the original text. So, and also so that they could put it on a farm. It could be a working farm. But the problem is right now, if somebody came in with seven or eight, eight acres and got a permit for a barn for a horse, technically without a residential structure, we couldn't even give it to them because it says you have to have a minimum of 10 acres currently for a riding stable other than accessory. So that's, we kind of figured that out in the last week or so that even currently there was a problem with the ordinance the way that we interpreted mm -hmm. it. No, that makes sense to me. I just, like I say, you know, as time goes on, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's going to be harder and harder to find larger parcels. But, um, you know, you might have people pass on a five-acre parcel or a seven-acre parcel, and then it just ends up getting developed yeah, um, sure. normally. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we would lose some some uh, equestrian-type development there. So that we didn't. I think we just need to consider it and talk about that. Ten acres is an awful lot of property right now to purchase in Milton um, and it, it just seems like to me it's it's a little bit too large to require anything that uh, uh, this kind of restrictions on anything less than 10 acres and and you know I'll be honest with you it, it also pro totally prohibits it looks like all covered riding areas in the front and you know if somebody's got 50, 100 acres, I, I don't know that I'm comfortable telling them that they got to put their house right next to the street just so they can put a riding area behind it. Right. Um, so it just seems like to me that this is just a little, it's, a, it, it's, it's all or nothing. And with the way that our variance code is written so that hardship is so difficult to achieve, it doesn't really a, allow you much flexibility. It's saying, okay, you're going only in this box, and, and, and that's what you have to do. And I don't think that it really does what we had hoped to do, which I, I thought was to try to, to encourage the equestrian uh, aspect of our community. George, did you have you want to? I, Again, just, just for clarity, if you're talking about a situation where there is no house and you're trying to build a barn on a piece of property, that's an accessory use, and that is allowed, and there's no 10-acre minimum. I mean, that's exactly what we discussed at the Planning Commission. The 10-acre minimum that's in here is, apply, is applicable to non-accessory uses when the primary use is, or is, is a, a residence. If, if it's an accessory use, there isn't any restriction that says it's got to be 10 acres. But if you have 50 acres here in your house in the back of the 50 acres, you really have no place to put a, a barn in front of it. Sure you do. It's, if it's 50 acres, then you've got you've satisfied what we propose, which is a 10-acre minimum. Not if it's a covered riding area. Well, the question is, and, and this is, I guess we're taking advice from the Milton Horse Council. You know, if you're going to build a covered riding arena, you're not going to build something that's going to be minuscule. It's going to be large, or else you're not going to build it. It's going to have to be substantial enough for whatever that purpose is. How big a riding arena do you want? And even if it's a 50-acre parcel, how big a riding arena do you want on that property, out in front of that property? And what level of scrutiny do you want for the, the approval to get that? Well, and that's what a use permit would, 
would require you to go through those steps, correct? So does a variance. No variance, you have to have a hardship. So. I understand, but the, that's, the variance, my, that's and my you're point not about have the. A hardship that's my point about the level of scrutiny. Our, our okay. point of view was that there should be a hardship if you're going to be putting a massive structure in front of a of a, of a piece of property because we don't know where it's going to be, we don't know how big it's going to be, et cetera. But a hardship it cannot be at all self-imposed. If you bought the property and the house happened to be at the back of the 50 acres, then that puts you in a very difficult situation. You may never be able to really put a barn on, or, or a covered riding arena on that piece of property. Agree. And, Ever. And, and it was our, it was, sorry, I agree with you, and it was our point of view that that is in keeping with what the community wants, is that that would only be required in a hardship situation. I, you know, I guess my opinion is, and I understand, um, you know, there are different scenarios if you don't fall into one of these scenarios that you go back to a, a variance or it, it falls into the code differently, but... I think we may need to make this ordinance uh, as we move forward as, as friendly looking as it can be to the equestrian or uh, I say equestrian really just agricultural use. Um, I know in the past we've had some agricultural uses that have passed and moved on because of, of certain requirements and uh, so uh, you know again I think we if it's the council's intent I, I think we need to go as as friendly so that it doesn't it doesn't scare people off if they're looking at a piece of property so. but it's the same time because they have to have a use permit we do have some control over it so that you don't right, have just anything yeah. you know you don't have a person putting a huge riding rink on a two-acre lot and right. surrounded by houses I, I think maybe you have if you want to step up it's be glad to there is a difference in a barn and a covered ring really those are kind of two different animals um, and the, the, what they're proposing for barns, you know, in the front yard is all great. The covered rings are a little more controversial because they can be bigger. Just by their nature, they're steel, they're covered, they're taller. Um, I agree with what Karen is trying to say. If you have a 50-acre property and 40 of those acres are between you and the road, people are going to want to put a covered ring in that 40 acres. And you would think there would be enough buffering in a 40 acre or a 20 acre land area to be able to accommodate that. In, in that case, the use permit would seem to me to be the better avenue to consider that on a case by case basis, to claim a hardship. It's very hard to come in, as you said, and claim a hardship. So I am not in support of a variance where you have to prove a hardship. I like the idea more of a use permit where you have some control and some regulation over that but it's not something so difficult that we are deterring really world-class operations from coming in here. It is astonishing how well-known some of these dressage instructors and hunter-jumper instructors are. Gunnar Sedell is coming to Shenandoah Farm. He is an Olympian. He is amazing. He's coming here for a clinic. There are some people with a lot of money that really want to run some really high-class operations. They're not coming in looking at a three-acre, five-acre lot to put their world-class equestrian center on. They're looking at the bigger ones, and they would want a covered ring. So to be able to look at that in a use permit and have established guidelines, be considerate of our neighbors, but not make it a hardship for something like that, to me that would seem to be the more appealing way to go um, just to promote ourselves as an equestrian community and also to bring that kind of world-renowned, you know, here, Hunt Tosh, was the world hunter jumper rider, you know, two years ago. I mean, everyone knew who Hunt Tosh was. He has a farm over on Freemanville Road. I don't believe it has a covered ring, but he has a lot of property. I don't know if he's interested in building one, but would we, you know, would we say you, it has to be a hardship for you to put in a covered ring? I just, I know you want to be friendly to the equestrian community. We also want to be considerate of our neighbors. It seems to me that the use permit would enable us to do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. No. Uh, yeah, Kathy, this is more for my education than anything else. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the use permit under a covered ring, you know, we already have the structure built, you know, but what exactly are we limiting exactly what can be done underneath that structure? And, and, and the reason why I asked as well, but from a barn perspective, you know, we may have a, a use permit for the 
you know, we're building the barn, but a use permit for exactly which particular animals can be in that barn. And the reason why I asked that specifically because if we're limiting it originally to just horses, you know, sometimes uh, horses require having a goat, as an example, as an accompaniment to keep the horse calm, for example. You know, is that how that's done by applying for a use permit for the specific uses of the animals underneath that? Again, this is me being a new city council member. I'm just trying to make sure I understand. Well, the, we have two recommendations, one from the Planning Commission, which is just to limit barns to horses. Mm -hmm. And then uh, then ours where we, um, because we have talked to people who have goats, for instance, sure. and who wanted to put the goats in the, in the barn as well. Um, and, and then, of course, you run into the whole enforcement issue. You know, to what extent am I to enforce in a barn the different animals in there? I mean, so, so we, we just felt that it would be a lot cleaner and friendly to have domesticated, to, to use... Uh, the, the term, uh, you know, um, domesticated animals in, in the barn as opposed to limiting it to one s specific type. Um, in terms of the, 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 the first part of your question about the, the criteria and about a covered ring, um, what we will, if you should go, decide to go that route, what our next step would be would be to come up with criteria for a use permit for uh, covered rings or are, are uncovered rings that have lights or um, bleachers so that we could come up with a very clean set of, of criteria that we would use so as to minimize impact. Because the other side of the coin is we do get phone calls very frequently from um, homeowners who are near uh, someone who has a covered ring and that's being used for commercial purposes and it does have a, a higher intensity of use which does impact uh, or, or could impact neighbors and whatnot. So you have to be really careful about what those criteria are that you use for, for rings, and, um, and that's something that we would do. And then, of course, those applications those for our use permits would come th through the city council for your review and approval on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, so it, criteria is like, you know, photometric architectural standards, hours of operation, things like that. Yeah, it, would, it wouldn't be it would be less the design standards because that would go to the DRB for, for, for their review. Okay. But in terms of um, how far is it, is it setbacks, okay. size, um, right now our current zoning ordinance s speaks to, and I, I didn't want to get it too complicated in here, but our, for instance, our current zoning ordinance says that if you've got four acres or less, you can only build um, a certain size covered arena. If you've got yes. over four acres, then, then you could build a larger size. So those are the types of things that we'd have to sort through, uh, again, to, to make sure that we were protecting the rights of the neighbors in an area so it would not adversely be impacting them. And the use permit process would involve the Planning Commission as well, is that correct? Does our use does permit the process yes. involve the Planning yeah. Commission to review it and make recommendations on the planning on it? as well as the process. Yes. Okay. I'm going to move to your topic number two now, fences. Yes, okay. Oh, <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, uh, it says here that... Uh, I forgot all about. Thank you for reminding me. It, it says that fencing material and height along public street, it says allowed fencing material, but it doesn't require somebody who goes and builds a house on a public street that's a, on a two-acre lot that's zoned AG1 to necessarily put a fence in. It just says if they're going to put a fence in, this is what they're allowed to put in. That's correct, yes. Okay. And um, have we considered that colors that would be allowed in this fence? Because, I mean, I know in the past we have always said either did it black or white or something like that, but we don't want any... You know, red yeah, or blue fences right. or uh, Robin, do, do, does the DRB <coughs> review that fence? No, so it's yeah, but, I mean, that's something we could do. Yeah, we, I mean, it just we, makes sense we, that you we, would we want it black, white, or brown. You don't mm -hmm. want it to be some kind of that's right. We don't want it West to color. be uh, right, absolutely right. I would agree with that. So thank you for bringing up issue number two, which is the fencing. <laughs> and, um, and the Planning Commission did review this, and, and the Planning Commission and the staffs uh, are clearly are, are in, in um, uh, agreement. So. Well, maybe on the, on the same topic, uh, I believe it's been in the uh, sign ordinance 
previously, or still is, that uh, whenever a property is transferred, the non-conforming sign uh, has to be removed and the new owner has to conform. Would you think of doing the same thing with fences? Hmm. That's the question for our attorney. I'm going to defer to him. Oh, dear. <coughs> well, would a fence be grandfathered in? Until yeah, you I don't know that the transfer impacts the, uh, uh, the non-conforming status of it. If, if they were taken, if it, if it were taken down or removed, that would destroy the non or expand it. There, there's certain things that can't be done to it, but just the ownership change doesn't. Uh, because with the signs, it's only if you're changing the wording of the sign. If you're actually keeping the name of the sign, even if you transfer ownership, it's still grandfathered well, in, correct? The so it's only if you're actually changing a certain percentage of the sign itself that right or, or it's, it's no longer completely destroyed or, right it's mm -hmm. no longer grandfathered in right mm -hmm. so, so you, what you're saying is that it's the same uh, type of analogy right right okay any other questions on that if you want to talk about any of them the, back to the horse the barns and Rings or anybody got their questions answered or, as well as so we much. need to give the staff some direction though as yeah that's <clears throat> do you need some direction or do we just need to look at um, both planning commissions and staff recommendations and be prepared you know if we have any more questions between now and we need to make a Decision uh, or sure, right. that, that's absolutely fine. And if you, but if you have any requests for, for further information or questions to be answered, um, or you know, either tonight or during the next week, uh, we'll be happy to provide that information. I'd like to get personally comfortable to, with planning commission and staff on the, the 10 acre minimum because that gives me a little bit of heartburn there. But I don't want to fully understand that and, and planning commission's intent there. Yeah, if staff could give us the information, you said there were minimums all in other parts of our ordinance as far as what is allowed on what size parcel. If you could get that information to us, I think that might kind of help. Okay. Realize you're not going to have a huge riding rink on a lighted riding rink on a two acre. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, it, it speaks to, I think, a four acre or less and then beyond that. If you could get us that, I think it would be helpful. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, Laura, do you have a comment? And I assume it's all right with council to uh, yeah. have uh, just one quick, community members. I just wanted to make you aware that it's common for riding arenas, covered riding, to be reused and moved from place to place. So when the use permit gets discussed, you might want to make sure that, I mean, they can be old and ugly. I just want you to know that. So that's something to, to be in the consideration of the, the use permit. And also, you know, this is discussing covered riding arenas, arenas. There's also indoor riding arenas that are fully enclosed, and that's probably separate. But those can be moved also from place to place. So just so you know, there's, there's one on Birmingham Road. It sits back quite a ways. And, I mean, they're just, you know, I'm, I think everyone is feeling that these are going to be shiny new things and you might just want to take into consideration that someone might have in their plans to reuse one from a different facility because that's what trainers do when they relocate they take everything they own and they try to put it on a new parcel so okay. Bill did you have a kind of uh, comment uh, addressing that it still have to go in front of DRB I would assume I would assume so. Right? Um, I mean, Relocated facility? Um, right now we only have the one that we mentioned, the four acre, more, more or less than four acres. That's only, I'm just, I'll answer your question, but I just want to clarify the four less, four acres or less um, structure. That's only reviewed by the DRB if it's considered um, a commercial, but typically we've, are, we've already had them look at 
um, when it was a variance, the DRB would get a courtesy review of the structure. So I guess what I'm saying, if there was a large barn in the front, we're not going to review that if it's a part of a residence for the design review board because that would be an accessory structure to the residence and we don't deal with single family type uses. But as far as <coughs> for the size, I'm trying to think through. The DRB only um, reviews for um, when it's. Uh, but I, I would think when it's just commercial, right? Yeah. So if, if it's just with no house on it, and it's a riding ring rink, or it's a structure, a indoor stable, whatever riding stable, the DRB would review it. If it's associated with the residence, they don't look at it. But can we have them look at it if it's a covered one? We can in the use permit. Yeah, yes. this is a part of a use permit. Yes. I think that would be very important to have them look at it to make sure it's it is something that is. I agree. Right. Well, well, my point was particularly a relocated facility. Right. And it would be a site plan. Excuse me. It'd be a site plan specific. So if they want to move it, then they're going to have to come back again and have it reviewed again. So they can't just go and move it at their own will. They'd I agree, but I think that. the point was they could relocate an old. Right. ugly facility onto a new piece of property. Right. But uh, if the DRB was looking at it, they'd have to look but at right pictures. Right now, we're only, yeah, we could put that in the use like. permit. That, that would, yeah. That's what we would do. That would yeah. be good. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. We'll uh, move on to our next item, the city clerk call. Found item number four. We have one public comment from Mr. George Ragsdale. Sorry, same uh, same uh, tune, different uh, different song, I guess. Um, first, the the planning commission absolutely supports the, uh, uh, the the signed ordinance that's in front of you. Um, I want to just clarify a couple of things. One, uh, the cover letter I think that uh, uh, the community development department sent you indicated that we've had six separate meetings uh, to look at and make modifications and recommendations on the planning on the uh, sign ordinance. Um, it doesn't reference the number of times that the subcommittee that worked on that got together. A lot of hours were spent by them, but I just want to clarify one thing. When you look at the marked up copy of that ordinance, it indicates that the changes that the Planning Commission recommended are in gray. And I think if you read through that, you'll find there are only two places in that whole ordinance where there's any gray. I don't want you to think that we met for six times and we came up with those two changes. The bulk of the changes that are in there in yellow uh, were changes that were uh, that emanated from the reviews but from the Planning Commission. Again, from a process standpoint, the only thing I would point out um, that's consistent with the last speech that I made is the whole section at the end of this, the enforcement section was added after we had voted on it and after we had passed this as were the comments from the attorney. Um, now, that's not to say that we disagree with those, but to be honest with you, we've never even discussed them because we never saw them before they were disseminated. Um, particularly the enforcement piece, which is the last section in there, was never presented to us. So I would ask you if you're going to vote to approve or not to look at that carefully because it hasn't been subject to review by anybody at this point. Okay. Okay. Our next item is discussion of RZ 1117 to amend Article 16 of the Zoning Ordinance, Chapter 64 of the City Code, Signs. Ms. Kathy Field. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, just by way of background, uh, quickly, uh, the City's original sign ordinance was adopted in December 2006. And since that time, it has remained intact with no major amendments. During the last five years, the Community Development Department has heard from local business owners as well as citizens regarding this ordinance. And a list of overall concerns um, was developed uh, to uh, uh, address these uh, proposed changes that were brought forward to us by uh, the business owners and, and the citizens. And those uh, changes included um, Signs during sale or lease of property, grand opening signage, banners, location and duration, incidental signage, including tenant directories, directional freestanding signs, 
the uh, uh, signs um, in the Crabapple and Birmingham overlay districts as it relates to wall signs for multi-tenant double frontage of buildings and window signage. Um, as George mentioned, a subcommittee, uh, th this, this issue was brought to the Planning Commission and they formed a subcommittee that met several times on this and then subsequent to that, uh, there were two work sessions held, formally held by the Planning Commission and then four Planning Commission meetings. Uh, subsequent to, to those meetings, that document was then reviewed by our legal counsel. And um, in front of you tonight, you have a uh, revised February 10th, 2010. And, and really what happens over the last week, uh, staff uh, found some typos and things, and so we tweaked it. So I would ask you to use that February 10th so that we all stay on the same page as we go through this. Um, that copy shows the red lines, and, and essentially the red lines are the changes done by the Planning Commission uh, and then revised um, as needed by our city attorney. So that's what the red line says. And then you have a plain copy, which is the uh, uh, copy that incorporates all of the red line changes at that time. Um, I'm going to go through this on a page by page um, uh, manner. Um, I uh, will point out to you the new sections, and especially those sections where I thought that there was a significant change that you needed to know about. Um, all the other changes that are in red, and you'll see some in green. The green designates that it was moved from one location to, to another. But the, the, the red, um, there was a lot of reformatting that has taken place in this, a little wordsmithing, tweaking, as, as I mentioned. So um, I, I'll move through page by page and point out to you the, uh, uh, n what is new per page. And then clearly, if you have any questions, um, please, um, please stop me and we can discuss it. Paul Fricke was the attorney that reviewed this. And then Angela and Robin both, from a staff point of view, also spent many hours trying to compilate this together um, into the document that you see tonight. So having said that, I'm going to start on page one of the February 10th um, uh, version. And um, if uh, you look at the bottom, there are, uh, you'll, see two new, you'll see two definitions. One, uh, one, one up from the bottom is blade shingle. Sign means a sign which extends out from a building face or wall, so the sign face is perpendicular or at an angle to the building face or wall. That is new. And then underneath that, cholesterol means any high windows above eye level. That's also new. If you go on to page two, you'll see that the, uh, uh, the fourth definition down, uh, department means community development department or such other department as is given authority to implement this authority by the city. And then directly under that, the director, uh, we've added the language or such other department as is given authority to implement this authority by the city. Uh, halfway down, we have illegal activity. Signs mean signs which advertise an activity which is illegal under federal, state, or local laws. And then under illuminated signs, we've added the, the following language, including electric lights, luminous tubes, LED, neon, fiber optics, fluorescent. And then beyond the green you, writing, you'll see landscape strip. That is new. Landscape strip means an area required by this zoning ordinance or by conditions of zoning, which is reserved for the installation and maintenance of plant materials. And then directly below that, LED means an electronically controlled sign utilizing light emitted di di diodes to form some or all of the sign message. And then finally on this page, two further down, lollipop sign means a pole sign with an additional three-dimensional shape or sign at the top. So that, that is all new definitions on page two. Part, pardon me, can I make just one suggestion? Sure. Yes. Uh, just usually when reviewing something like this, uh, can we get line numbering turned on on a review page? That make it easier to refer by line, by page, and line. I just yeah, it just makes it simpler in going through documents. So. Yeah, um, we can future. certainly try that. Yeah, we can try. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I yeah, there's a lot of changes to write, and I and I I do right. apologize. Um, That's all right. I'm yeah. just. Um, okay. And um, I'm happy, you know, just to point out the definition, or but I think reading it at least uh, that's fine. focuses in. Okay. 
All right, I'm on page. I have one quick question. What is the green? The green is, is something that's been moved from another part of the document. It's not moved, it doesn't look it's like it's just moved in. Okay. It's now the, the, the green at the top of page three, for instance, was moved to the previous page. Okay. So you know, again, it's just a matter of. Okay. Uh, so we can we can ignore the green stuff. Yeah, ignore the green stuff. It's in there. It's just been moved in or moved out. Okay. All right, I'm on page three. I'm at the... Uh, One more thing, Kathleen. Yes, sir. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> We've got 60 pages to go through here. Yes. Are you going to read off all the stuff in red? No, just just the new stuff. Oh. And, and it really will go a lot faster, believe okay. me. This all is right. just slow just, right here. <laughs> I don't mind you guiding us through this. I just wanted to make sure you knew the scope of what you were doing. Yeah, no, no. I am reading to you just the new language that's been okay. added in. Right. Just to Good point it out to you. Joke. All right. Give her 10 minutes. And then it's, you know, I, and the rest of it is I try to, maybe I'll just I'll repeat it again. It's just been reformatted or moved in. So okay. it's it's just tweaking. And, and I'm not going to read all that, okay? Okay. But I'm just trying to point out to you uh, what's new because I... I well, I just flipped through it real quick and it looked more red than anything else. Yeah, yeah, well, but red. a lot of the red we're, we're, we're not getting. And only 57 more pages. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, this is arduous. So you can imagine you know, the Planning Commission spent six meetings on it. I mean, yeah. you know, and the staff has spent days. It's just, it's a, it's a lot of information and I just don't know how else to, to present it to you. In, in a way that's meaningful. We did so, get some pictures in the back, though. So okay. yeah, it, it actually goes pretty quickly. I mean, the, these definitions are sort of uh, a bear, but we'll get through them shortly here. Uh, I'm on neon signs, which is about the fifth one down. Neon signs means neon or other inert gas-filled tubing signs. This definition includes lighting banding, lighted banding used as trim around buildings or windows. Non-conforming sign is also new, which is the next one. Means any sign which was lawfully erected and maintained prior to the adoption, revision, or amendment of this article, uh, number 16 of the City of Milton Zoning Ordinance, uh, by which, by reason of such adoption, revision, or amendment, no longer meets or conforms to one or more such requirements within Article 16. Um, if you go th about three quarters of the way down, there's a pole sign definition, and that pole sign means a freestanding sign with visible support structures. I'm moving on to page four. And at the top of page four, uh, the second line, pylon sign means a freestanding sign with visible support structure or with the support structure enclosed with a pole cover. Um, about a third of the way down, shingle blade sign means a sign which extends out from a building face or wall so that the sign face is perpendicular or at an angle to the building face or wall. And then the very last of the definitions about a little over halfway down, zone development means property subject to a single zoning application. And that's it on page four. Page five, there's nothing for me to say. <laughs> page six we, you, you, is also um, uh, free of my comment. Um, page seven is um, also um, uh, just uh, basic uh, revisions and re reformatting, nothing new. Um, page 8, when we get halfway down to section 64-2269, which is uh, revocation, that is a section that was moved to the back. So you'll see that in the back. And I'm not sure why it's not green, but it's because, but it, it has been moved to the back. Oh, it was re rewritten a little. Okay, that's fine. Okay. I'm now on page nine, and the um, section 64-2273, which is suspension termination in the middle of the page, that was also moved to the back. Page 10, uh, essentially just uh, tweaking and reformatting. Page 11, there's a lot of red, but essentially that was just language cleaned up and a, a list made. And if you went to page 11 on your clean document, you would just see a, basically a clean list of all of these prohibited signs within the city. Page 12, at the top, we've added three new prohibitive signs, and they are uh, starting with the second uh, line here, temporary signs and banners attached to fences or walls unless specifically allowed. 
And then under 18, internally illuminated window signs, including neon, except as specifically allowed. And then under 19, signs and landscape strip, unless approved by the city arborists. So those are three new signs that have been added for it to be prohibited. Um, and then uh, section 6422.96, violations and penalties, that has all been moved to the back. Next page, page 13. The section 2298, removal of unlawful or dangerous signs, that's been moved to the back. And now we get to, uh, under sign location in the middle, under uh, section 642299, under C, I want to bring this to your attention because we have made some changes here that you need to be aware of. Under setback, um, we have changed, uh, uh, it says, unless a more restrictive setback is specified in conditions of zoning or otherwise in this article, all permanent ground signs shall set back 20 feet. It was originally 10. We changed that to 20 from the edge of pavement. No sign except authorized traffic signs shall project over the right of way. All temporary signs, as described in 642203, shall be placed at least 15 feet from the edge of pavement. No signs shall be placed between the road and the back of the landscape strip. So we've made that a little tougher. Didn't we have all temporary? Is, is, that, is that the same thing, a temporary informational sign, the same as a temporary sign? Because didn't we have a, a, a right-of-way right plus um, uh, restriction on that currently? You, you do. It's right away plus ten. Feet. So, in in essence, twenty feet from the edge of pavement is very similar to the right of way plus ten feet, I mean, and exactly about ten and a half feet. So. And going to the fifteen feet from edge of pavement, you're getting you're getting five. We're giving five five, five feet back. back. Yes, yeah, so this actually becomes a little bit less restrictive. Okay. I have a question too. Um, I, I guess the temporary signs that includes political signs as well. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Still remember. Yeah. I want to make sure. Yeah. Also, in that same topic, uh, would for sale signs, realty signs, uh, be in that category? 15 feet off the edge of the pavement. Yeah, Angela, yes. Next page. Page 15. Well, it's temporary real estate. It's the two by two, correct? Yes, but if it's a permitted, I think later on we'll talk about how are we allowing more signage, so as a more permanent, but yeah, the temporary two by twos, real estate signs, that would apply. <coughs> okay, the 15, 15 yeah. foot restriction. Yeah, the 20, we would have tried to enforce it at the 20, now we're okay. making a little bit less with 15. I know that's a big concern for the real estate uh, community. Paul, do you want to please? Yeah. Come on up to the mic. Come up to the microphone. microphone. Paul Moore, fifteen two ninety White Columns Drive, uh, Milton. Um, just and Kathleen's doing a wonderful job of working through this, and, and as she pointed out, the Planning Commission literally did go page by page every time we met, so we we are pretty familiar with this. And the, the point that I think on this, to make it really simple and really clear, is we did, um, to a great extent, with the real estate community in mind, try to make it really simple and clear. Also, to the <coughs> everyday citizen who's trying to put a sign out, half the, I mean, 99% of the people don't know what the right of way is. So the whole point behind that was to simply say, from the edge of the road, here's the measurement. Nobody has to figure out anymore with maps or platting where the edges of the right of way are. Mm -hmm. So that's the whole point. I just interrupt too before we get a whole lot further down this road. Is this is this a helpful format for y'all to go through this ordinance, or is this uh, is this page by page what you had envisioned? Would you like the higher level? Do you like this detail? What's what's going to help? I don't. We, we certainly don't mind doing it, but we're here for a multi-hour discussion if we continue to go through page by page, which is which is fine. I just want to make sure that that's what you all want. It's up to the council. We're one sixth of the way through it, Chris. Oh, well. come on! Yeah, and there's on. pictures at the back. Yeah. It's going to be snow. It's snowing at midnight. Yeah, so I'm, just, I'm trying to get y'all home before it sleets. That's all. I think uh, you know, we seem to be moving through pretty good. So, um, sorry, with council, we'll continue this way, and we'll kind of 
Chris, when we get about halfway through, we'll look at it again and see. <laughs> okay, well, just let me know. I'm, I'm here to do what you'd like. You okay. I, I, I am moving on now. Off of 13, I'm moving. There's nothing for me to say on 14. When we get to 15, I'd like to talk about under, uh, under 1 uh, C. I guess it's 1 C, then it says 3. It says... Um, signs during the sale or lease of property. Mm -hmm. During the sale or lease of property, one sign per road frontage of the property for sale or lease shall be allowed. The sign shall not be, inter shall not be internally illuminated. The sign shall not exceed nine square feet on major roads, which are listed below there, and six square feet on all other roads. A permit shall be required for signs greater than six square feet. Uh, currently, we, uh, it says signs from Four feet, mm -hmm. four square feet. So we've we've upped the the uh, size allowed for signs during the sale or lease of property. And we try to be cognizant. If you're on a major highway, we made them a little larger. If you're not, you're you're. And that's still no. That's three by three. So that's not a yeah. yeah. Huge sign. No. <clears throat> On the major roads, people are driving by faster, so mm -hmm. you want them to be big enough that people can see. Right. Them. Exactly. And I like in there too that the, the up in number two, where we've added the get the signs down after a certain time too. I think that's a plus. Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> yes, seven calendar days. We have to get them down. Um, and then under banners, right below that uh, d d discussion item we just discussed, under B banners, it says um, that there is a new sentence that's been added which is the second sentence and it says in addition each new business shall be allowed a banner for 30 consecutive days starting from the issuance of the business license or occupational tax certificate so what's it, what is it, that is saying now is that you know you're allowed a banner for no more than 10 consecutive days four times a year however if you have a new business we're going to give you a banner for an additional 30 consecutive days that's to help the new business announce themselves till they get their signs and whatnot. So, so that's what that means. That is new. Did you have a question? Uh, that's restrictive uh, in the sense that it starts from those two events, the business license and tax certificate. Suppose they want to postpone it for 10 days, 12 days. Yeah, it, it, I think it's just tied to any time, you know, after that. You're just saying we'll be you're, reasonable you're about it. Your intent is 30 days after yeah, each yeah. of those, but I, doesn't I mean, trigger it. Right. I, I think if they were six months into the business, we might not look at them as such a new business. You know, we'd have a little concern. But, you know, if they needed some time to, 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 to get open or, or want to, you know, announce their business, we would work with them. Can I add one other thing back to the um, – Number two there, mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if it would be in here or just our other stuff, but um, people leave their um, rezoning and all that kind of stuff signs up forever. Mm -hmm. I sure would like to see us get those down after action is taken on the zoning matter, so we don't see those blue or yellow or green. Or that's a good point, and that's mm -hmm. something that I don't necessarily think yeah. it needs to be in this, but right, I, I, I think that's uh, okay. Um, Okay, I'm, I'm going to move on. And now we're going to talk about signs in each of the zoning districts. Okay, so we're going to start first of all with the agricultural district. And I, I, I'm going to move on to page 16. And uh, if a lot of red, but don't get worried, just go down to B, other signage. And, and you'll see this as, as, as we go through all the zoning districts. We've added this, which says each development may post one banner, maximum 24 square feet. Uh, maximum four feet tall for a maximum of 40 days during graduation season. So this is the, the infamous graduation banner. So uh, we've written this into all the, most of the ordinances, zoning districts, and you'll see this. So the graduation banner is allowed, okay? And that's really the only new thing in the, in the AG1 district. And I guess really they could be put anything on that banner if we can't, we can't tell them what they can or can't put on that banner, but it's just during that time. That is correct. Okay, I'm now... Well stated. 
I, I'm now moving forward to single family, re at the very bottom, single family residential CUP and NUP districts. So if you turn the page on page 17 and you go three quarters of the way down onto, uh, under, um, I, I, under, it says two, it, it, that, again, there's the graduation banner. Okay, that's the only new addition to the language for the uh, residential single family district. Moving on to page 18. We're Could now I have into one question. I'm sorry. Yes. Where it says um, the flags and flagpoles, each development may display no more than one flag and flagpole. What if they want to fly the American flag and the state flag? Um, no more than on one. the same pole. Then that isn't that acceptable? I mean, in flag. Uh, Mr. City Attorney. As, as as I read the definition of flag is limited to the specific flag itself. So if it's limited to a single flag, no more than one flag would be a, a choice of state or mm -hmm. national. Is there a reason why they can't put two flags on one yeah. flagpole? Well, that was the question. Because yeah. it says we can't hear the door <laughs> in red and green somewhere too. But you you say they'd, they would have to, they'd have to get a variance right now. They'd have to get a variance. Yeah, right. But you could, uh, if it's up to you all, if you but how do you a second flag. How do you claim a hardship because you want to put a flag on there? <laughs> <laughs> George, you have a comment? Don't forget the flags is not just state. Right. Yes, right. That's right. 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 Mm. Mm. <laughs> so well, then we'll go with the one. Would it, yeah. You would leave it with one and then... Uh, if there's a variance and right, yeah, yeah. yeah that's just how it was written in the current ordinance, and we just didn't because you're not going to have a hardship for a flag. I mm -hmm. mean, I don't know what kind of hardship you could possibly have, so well, it does. Pure tech fan or something. Well, this is a the new council member asking is that a situation for a use permit, as we talked about earlier? How does that work? Flags are very with, hard. If subdivisions or, or other places of business in Milton are in violation of this today? Well, we have some grandfathered, like um, the uh, Fries. They have three flagpoles, but you notice they only have two flags up because they were only allowed to have two flags. And code enforcement told them to take down the third flag. Really? What's the third yeah. flag? We told them to take down one of the flags? <laughs> uh -huh. Yes. It was the Fries. Um, but that was, a, that was a condition when it was done in Fulton County. So, I mean... It's not like we go around measuring and looking for flags unless no, no, I understand that, that certainly. You have a citizen complain about it. Really? <laughs> well, I just know that there, you know, as a Boy Scout, I know there's plenty of opportunities to fly more than two flags. And I, I know it's not uncommon for people that want to fly flags to want to fly more than one. So it seems a little silly that we're getting ourselves in this business. I don't understand it. Well, you know, I, I just I can tell you in Roswell we had a problem with the flags in terms of automobile dealerships, mm -hmm. and they they'll put up the American flags and, and they use that as a commercial banner. So it's it's very you have to be very careful, and I'm sure Paul can speak to this when you're talking about flags, how you control it because people can really take advantage of it and uh, you know and you can have huge flags you know you've seen those on automobile dealerships you've seen many flags so you know where it, do you draw the line I guess? yeah but is there any circumstance under which a really really large American flag is a bad thing mm -hmm. or a really large Georgia flag according to us there is it's gonna be 24 square feet well the same point and I think as it relates to commercial uh, enterprises like uh, Fry's or Kohl's, you know, a, a 24 square flag kind of gets uh, lost in the. Yeah, it's not really good. You know, it's fine on a residence or a yeah. you know, smaller property. Well, it's a function of the height of the pole, too, obviously. Sure. You know. Right. Well, we can certainly go back and look at that and do some more homework and come up with some options for you if you'd like us to. Yeah, I mean, we don't need any, you know, 200 feet 
flag, yeah. square yeah. foot flag, but at the same time, 24 feet on a big tall five pole does seem a little. Four, four by six, yeah, more residential size. Yeah. Okay. So, so maybe in a commercial out. area, you need something a little well, bit more. I still think we got to address the, yeah. whether it's one flag or right. more. Well, I'm of attitude. We need to what direction do you keep want? it. Keep it to one and then a variance if there's a. Well, there's there's no, I, there never could get a variance though because you don't have a hardship. hardship. So, I mean, mm -hmm. the way our variance code's written, there's no variance that could possibly allow. I mean, how do you. I think two on a single pole with some sort of size per flag type mm -hmm. of thing would be an option. You mean like a major flag and a minor flag? Or just two. In terms of size. Whatever, the, the, you know. You do a total square foot. Well, I don't even know that. That's the X per, per flag. Or keep them but, Joe, I mean, don't people fly on an American flag and a state flag on the same Yeah, that's, that's permissible, but uh, it's more common American flags on top. To, to have, if you're going to have more than one flagpole, you have three. Mm -hmm. You've got the American flag, you've got the state flag, you've got some auxiliary flag, whether it's a, an older version of American flag or whatever. So, so I, again, I don't understand why we would want to limit I can't conceive, I guess, where we're abusing flags to the point that they're problematic. Well, it's limiting well, again, what the flags say. Yeah, again, I think the them. flag could be anything, right? It, you know, we're not saying. Yeah, it's, it's like a sign. You, you can't control content. Just like Somebody could sign. put a flag yeah, okay, up and put a banner on When does something cease being a flag and become a sign? An American flag is not a sign. Based on what it's made of, essentially. No, no, but... Okay. Uh, obviously, we didn't want to start a debate on this, but I guess we know what flags are. We know what signs are. Right. We should allow people to fly flags if they want to fly flags, and we shouldn't try to curtail what they do. But we should curtail them flying signs as flags. But you can't. That's... What you're saying, you got a banner, or whether it's a flag, or it could put, they could say. All we can do is out. define what it what it is, but you can't define what's in it. That's the problem. So that UGA flag flying up there is, yeah. Well, that's a legitimate that's flag. Fixed. No, it's not. <laughs> so is an Auburn flag. No, I, I'm. Yeah. Yeah. Those, right, those yeah. aren't signs. The but universities have flags. Top, right. The city of Milton. Do we have a flag? Yes. So how are we going to fly our flag, We're not. And the state flag, and the U.S. flag? We're not. Because well. we should be flying all three. How about a POW MIA flag? Is that a sign? It's a flag. If, if it was made out of constructed, yeah. yeah. So should Fab it? Fabric or bunting. It would be a. It would be a flag. Yes. Yeah. These. These are going w w with the development, so your entry to your development. All right. So should we? Are we safe to go with one flag and see? You know, if we need to adjust it later, if it becomes a problem. I mean, if we leave it open ended. We'll, well, we'll, we'll be glad to look for some lang alternative language for you. And yeah. We can come back and. Okay. Okay. Okay, I, I, I'm, I'm going to move on. I'm on page 17. I'm under the par apartment and townhouse residential districts. And, and again, at, at the, the bottom, we've got new language, and that's the, the graduation banner is allowed. The same language as before. I'm in a, now I'm on the next page, page 18. I'm in the apartment and townhome residential districts. And again, um, let's see, um, we've got the graduation banner three quarters of the way down. And um, and that's that's about it. The uh, the flag language has been re revised to match the other flag language that you've talked about. Um, I'm in O and I districts now, so I'm moving on to page 19. And um, we now are looking um, into wall signs at the bottom. And here is a, another policy change for you under the O and I districts. Um, wall signs, which are allowed, obviously, we have made a language change that says that single tenant buildings and end units of multi tenant buildings may have an additional wall sign. So they can have more than two. Right now, businesses are allowed no more than two wall signs. So this is number three sign. Um, question. Okay. And that's in the O and I district. How about uh, Birmingham Crossroads area? 
uh, and there's some down here on Bethany and Nine, where uh, there are two exposures to the interior of the development and to public, <coughs> public right of way. Well, are it, two well, signs, it, two wall signs allowed there then? Um, we actually address that further in the ordinance when, we're, when we discuss the overlays. This section is broken up by zoning, so it doesn't specify the, or, the overlays in this, depart, in this part. Yeah, what, once we get through all the zoning districts, we're then going to talk about overlays. And in the overlays, we have some very specific language about that, too. But I think even currently, you're allowed three on the corner, <coughs> two per side, and then one on the other corner, correct? Right, right, and that third one is the, um, well, in Birmingham, you're allowed one plus a shingle sign. Okay. There's uh, some out parcels at uh, Nine and Bethany at the Publix Shopping Center. Um, they have exposure to the, not only to Highway Nine and Bethany, but exposure to back side of their buildings <coughs> facing Publix, how is, how is that addressed? Are they uh, entitled to a sign on the back side of the building? No. They have to choose which side they want to put their additional sides, corner, correct, Angela? Yeah, no. so they have to, they can't so, have them all over. Well, they suppose can, they're not on the corner, they're in the middle of the... Well, right, part. I mean, they can't have it in the front, rear, and side of their building no matter where they are on the development. They had to choose where they wanted it on the side facing the highway or the side facing the internal part of the sub, right. of the uh, shopping center. Mm -hmm. Correct. And um, I know at least one of those units out there has a variance for the entire building to have that second sign on the like the back. So yeah, that's been an issue for a while. That's for crab apple, right? The variance on the opposite side. You mean on Bethany Well, crab the same way. You've got, you've really got. That's overlay. Yeah, but you've got, you've really got um, people coming from the main road and from the parking area. Right. To, yeah. To try to figure out what. Well, we're, 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 we have a section on crab apples, and we get to crab apple. Let's but but that overlay that. Yeah. would just overlay what's on here, so it can't be, it can't be less restrictive than. Than the zoning, it can only be more restrictive. Uh, An overlay can't be less restrictive than your zoning ordinance. It's it can only, more restrictive. Yeah, I mean, it so can only be more. Basically, for crab apple in Birmingham, they're allowed two signs. They're allowed one that's flush and one shingle sign. So, and then they can choose where they want to put it. Plus, they have sandwich signs. But um, okay, so um, we are on page 19 at, at the bottom under wall signs. We're still in the O&I district. So, so that the single tenant and the end of multi-unit buildings may have an additional wall sign, okay? I'm gonna move on now to page 20. And, um, uh, and I will tell you for the O&I, we added the flag uh, section D halfway down on page 20 because they did not have a section that allowed flags. So we put that in. I'm going to move on now to mixed-use districts. And there is nothing on page 20 under misuse districts. If, when you get to 21, however, you'll see again the graduation banner and the flag uh, section, which were both added to the mixed-use district. Three-quarters of the way down on page 21, we have a new, another zoning district, commercial and industrial park districts. There's nothing more on page 21. There's nothing more on page 22. And we, when we get to 23, you'll see that we added the flag section because that was not allowed previously in that district. I'm now on to industrial districts, and there's nothing more on page 23. And on page 24, under wall signs, we've added that uh, number one under wall signs, C1, single tenant buildings and use of multi tenant buildings may have one additional wall sign. So that's now allowed. And then as you move down, flags are now allowed in, in this district. And then our last district are mobile home park districts. And there's nothing more on 24. And then when you, 
uh, get to uh, page 25, there is um, under other signage, B1, um, I'm going to have to read this to you because it gets very fragmented, but it says each development may display up to 12 square feet of signage with no single sign greater than four square feet. So that has been revised and um, uh, that language has been added. And then we have the graduation banner is added and then the flag uh, display section is added. And that is the end of all the zoning districts. <coughs> now we're heading into the overlay districts. We go to page 26. We're going to start with the Route 9 overlay district. And uh, under that, if you go to D, A, B, C, D, for multi-tenant retail commercial office or institutional developments, numbers 2, 3, and 4 are all new. And I'll read them to you. Two says, the banner shall be placed on the tenant storefront or wall space. Three says, if the building location renders installation on the wall not visible from the road, an administrative variance may be applied for to allow the banner to be installed on the ground. The variance shall condition the banner placement to a specific location on the development. And then two subsections under that are, all ground mountain banner, all ground mounted banners shall be installed in the PVC frame or its equivalent. Secondly, if the banner is required to be placed behind a fence, the banner sh shall have a maximum height of 12 feet. And then item number four reads, no more than four ground mountain banner, more, no more than four ground mounted banners may be displayed in a zone development at one time. So those two, three, and four are all new sections. Okay. Moving on to page 27, under the, uh, the second um, paragraph, which is L, uh, it reads as follows now, permanent and temporary signs and windows shall not exceed, now this is a policy change, rather than five, it's been changed to 20% of each uh, window. The area of the doors and glass panels are excluded from the calculation of the applicable sign area. The area of cholesterol windows is excluded from the calculation of the applicable sign area. So we are allowing up to 20% of window signs in the Route 9 overlay to have signs on them. Then I'm moving down, uh, two paragraphs down to N, and, and this is all new as well. And it says, notwithstanding the prohibitions contained in subsection R below, each commercial establishment shall be entitled to a maximum of two internally illuminated window signs. If the establishment has a single internally illuminated window sign, the sign may be a maximum of four square feet in size and may be neon or LED illumination. If the establishment has two internally illuminated window signs, Neither sign may be larger than two square feet in sign, and only one may be neon or LED, while the second may be of other illumination. All internally illuminated window signs shall be positioned on the interior as a window sign, not more than 10 feet from the floor, with at least one sign being not more than five feet from the main public entrance to the commercial establishment. None of the internally illuminated window signs may blink, flash, fluctuate, or be animated in any way. Internally illuminated window signs may only be illuminated during the time the commercial establishment is open to the public for business. Any sign on or within five feet of a window is considered a window sign for purposes of application of this section. So that is all new. Is this our open and closed? Yes. Our open signs? Yes. So you can have one four foot one that opens and closes, or two small ones. Even though they don't have to say ones. open, that's what this yeah. really is for. Yeah, but we can't we can't yeah, legislate right. content. Okay. Remember yeah, that. But that's what this. They could is say really Schlitz allowed. on it or a Budweiser, I guess, or I don't know. But I mean, it's it's a flashing sign. <laughs> <laughs> but it can only be on while they're open. Oh, so. Only open. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm moving on to page 28, and we don't have to. This is just all reformatting on page 28. Nothing to talk about. Um, and then on page 29, and again, we're still on the Route 9 overlay uh, under the, the top there under um, I. That's new. It says internally illuminated window signs except as allowed in section 64, 23, 24, and 
So we added that. Um, I'm moving on now. I'm moving through 30. We're halfway through. Mm-hmm. I'm moving into crab apple. Now, as you know, crab apple, we had a lot of input from the crab apple merchants who did come to the planning commission meetings. And um, so, and they did, at the final meeting, did come and say that they were pleased with what had happened. And I'm sure the planning commission can speak to that as well. But um, I'm moving through. I'm on page 33 now. And under B, under wall signs, under 5, we added, again, that issue about the single-tenant buildings and N units of multi-tenant buildings may have an additional wall sign. So, again, they're going from 2 to 3. I'm sorry. Uh, they're going from 1 to 2. Yes, sorry. And then the, the, the next one, uh, under 6, we change, it says, a building may have an additional sign perpendicular to the wall with a maximum sign area size of four. Privilege was two. So this is the perpendicular blade sign that we've been talking about. <clears throat> and then at the very bottom, under other signage one, this is all new. Permanent and temporary signs and windows shall not exceed 20% of each window. The area of the doors and spandrel glass panels are excluded from the calculation of the applicable sign area. The area of cholesterol windows is excluded from the calculation if the, of the applicable sign area. Notwithstanding the prohibitions contained in subsection R below, each commercial establishment shall be entitled to a maximum of two internally illuminated window signs. If the establishment has a single internally illuminated window sign, the sign may be a maximum of four square feet in size and may be neon or LED illumination. If the establishment has two internally illuminated window signs, neither sign may be larger than two square feet in size and only one may be neon or LED, while the second may be of illuminated may be of other illumination. All internally illuminated window signs shall be positioned on the interior of, as a window sign, not more than 10 feet from the floor, with at least one sign being not more than five feet from the main public entrance. None of the internally illuminated window signs may blink, flash, fluctuate, or be animated in any way. Internally illuminated window signs may only be illuminated during the time the commercial establishment is open to the public. And then the next section is another new section. This deals with sandwich board signs. And the sign shall be single or double face, metal or wood framed, no plastic, black or green chalkboard type fence, located per ADA compliance, minimum of 36 inches from the building, no more than 10 feet from the building. Located so as not to impede pedestrian or vehicular traffic, not placed in tree, island, or landscape strip, maximum height of four feet, six square feet per panel, uh, and they must be brought inside the close of business. So that is all new too. Bruce, yes. I've got a question back going to the to the number one there. Yep. The, um, and this will relate to the other um, one we just discussed. Yeah. Um, the twenty percent of each window. Mm-hmm. Now is that is that like if if those were windows, each panel of those windows, you get twenty percent of each one of those. Yeah. Those yeah. things there, not of your front. That's not one window. Okay, got you. And then when it says that, okay, and then when it says the um, areas of door and the spandrel glass panels are excluded, what is that? I don't really understand what that means. That means you that that you can't have anything on your door, or you? How is that? I mean, um, that, to me, that door would be two windows. Well, if there were windows along the side, for instance, okay, yeah, you know, okay. that would be excluded from the calculation, and then up above the cholesterol, okay, that's excluded from the calculation. So it's just your big picture window type things that, you know. Yeah. Okay, but you, but but like above, that's a cholesterol mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. thing up there. You could yeah. could you have something up there? That's excluded from the calculation. So that means you excluded from putting anything on. There. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's not when you say twenty percent of window space, you, you you can't count that window up above as well, part of the window each, space. It says each window, doesn't it? So it's twenty percent of each window. So to me, uh, like that door front right there, you have three. Yeah, but, three but you, you can put it on the door. So, but you, but you can't include the window above the door. I'm hearing here. two different yeah. questions here. I'm hearing yeah. Bert ask a question. I'm not hearing that that, that that question's being answered. So what I'm hearing you ask is. There's this portion of glass above a door, potentially. Yep. Mm-hmm. Which is and even though it's not used for the purpose of calculating a percentage, is it still allowable to put signage on it? And if so, how much signage can That's you put on That's the question that? I heard, not whether or not it's oh, calculated, okay. whether or not signs can go there. Mm-hmm. That, would be, that would be no. <clears throat> well, if I read that, then it says that, that you can't 
put it on the door either. Well, there, there you can put. Count. You can, the there's certain thing. things that you, you have to have um, to identify your building anyway, sure. and you can put that on the door, that, yeah. the name, the hours, that sort of thing. So. Paul, do you have a comment on that? Do you want to step up? <laughs> <laughs> You'll stop if commenting. If you want to step up, you would. No, never mind. I don't want to walk up there. Why don't okay. <laughs> well, you guys move up to the front? To be you know, as you can imagine, we, we toiled over all this stuff, too. And the objective was, if you think about where we were, basically the, the business community was allowed very little signage at all. So all these are steps in the right direction. Um, Karen, before we go any further, I want to make sure, just to be clear about the signage, like Crab Apple, for example, originally they were allowed one. And if you now count the um, second sign, the blade sign, and the window signs, they went from really one to four. And a sandwich sign. And, and a sandwich board in Crab Apple and in Birmingham. So it's five. So the, the business owners are pretty pleased with where we went. And, some we, th and we think we need five? Well, um, <laughs> those are the most vocal community that we had was uh, Crab Apple. And if you, I think all of the things that we provided are within reason for business applications on each one of those considerations. Two-sided businesses, for example, the additional blade because of, of being perpendicular to um, Mayfield Road, for example. All those things made sense as you addressed each one of those to add an additional consideration for the uniqueness of the business area. So they are real pleased with where we went on that stuff. Uh, Bert, to go to your question about all the, all the ancillary uh, windows we were trying to take out of measure. Um, for example, if somebody had, um, I'm drawing a blank on what they're called, but like dormer mm -hmm. windows up on top, the idea wasn't to suddenly you had six dormers that were going to come into equation to be able to use that space in windows down below. So to make it really pure and simple and clean to measure, it's just the window panes that were intended to be windows for the business. There is a separate section that addresses the doors. You are required by, you know, by our code to have address sure, I mean, and yeah, business name and those kinds of things. So if, um, so if, in just looking at these examples back here, we've got one, two, three, what, six, six, six panels, six windows there. Right. Okay. So you could do twenty percent of each one of those windows, twenty percent of each individual window. Correct. But you or okay. So then, why would we? Or could you do? 40% of one and not do one? No. So then why, I don't understand why we need to, to call out out of the X calculation the spandrel or the doors or the celestial windows if they're not. Just to make it real clear, that was the only purpose for that, I think. Can you think of any other reason we did that, Angela? Um, yeah, just to, we, well, we just basically want to specify we didn't want signage in those areas. So, but on to me, it's not saying that. I get what you're wanting to say, but it's not saying that other than, I mean, I think we need to say that it, it, other than what you, we require as far as address and business information on your door, that's all we want on your door. But, but don't you typically not only have it for the windows, but also have a total that's allowed for the square footage of building size so that you don't end up with... 20% of all these windows having something on there? The sign ordinance still addresses the sign part of what's allowed on the building signs. We're, we're talking about Okay, so, so, so you couldn't put in 20% of each one of these windows with some kind of big horse uh, decal or something on them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you could. could. You could. On every single one of these windows. 20%. So we could have galloping horses going across mm -hmm. our windows. It's yeah. only one twenty percent of each individual window. Right. right. But you couldn't take those five windows with twenty percent and cover up one hundred percent of one. Window. I got you on that. Okay. Still, though, I mean, a window. I mean, my concern is a building like this that is all glass. That's an awful lot of signs that are loud. Whereas if you have a a, a building that's brick and it has glass windows, that's very very different. So a building like this that's all glass, that's a lot of galloping horse decals. It could be. It uh, mm -hmm. would be a fair application of the law across all. Yeah. 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 It's across all the different buildings. But, uh, but a, lot of, a lot of sign ordinances do not only talk about just the windows, but they talk about the total square footage of the building frontage, the building frontage so that you don't end up with, like I said, you know, all the way across the whole thing. Did y'all consider that? <laughs> well, 
I, I just, uh, if we're going to be honest here, which we should be, I, I think what happened is that we made, I think that the language of that section in each one of these overlays needs to be reworked because the, when it was first written, that 20 percent per each was not in there. And so the, the language with respect to the, the doors and the clerestory and the spandrel glass was intended to take that out of the equation for calculating the 20 percent overall. It's kind of what Karen was doing. Yeah, when we, put the, when we put the per each in there, we didn't go back and correct the language at the end. So I think it needs to be corrected so that it's clear. I can get, I can, I can get there. Um, all right, I'm at the bottom of 33 and moving on, unless anyone has any more questions about the 20 percent, whatever. And then I've gone on to 34, and we talked about the sandwich board, so we're done with 34 now. 35, there's nothing new. 36, we're now moving into the Birmingham cross Crossing Overlay District. And I'm on page 37, and I'm moving on to page 38. And on page 38, under wall signs, under 5, we have that new language again, that single tenant buildings and end units of multi-tenant buildings may have one additional wall sign. And then under that, under 6, we changed a, a, an additional sign perpendicular to the wall with a maximum sign area size of 4 square feet rather than 2. I'm on page um, 39. And again, we're still in Birmingham, and under other signage, these one and two are new. Uh, one is permanent and temporary signs of windows shall not exceed 20% of each window and shall not block visibility from outside the store. Uh, the area of the doors and cluster windows are excluded from the calculation of the applicable sign area. Eternally illuminated window signs are prohibited. And then <coughs> all that language on the sandwich board that we, I read in Crab Apple applies here as well. It, we haven't changed it's the same language. <coughs> and, and my earlier point, we require a certain amount of brick or stone or something like that on buildings in Crabapple and Birmingham. So you're not going to have a whole glass front like you do here, correct? Yeah, because it's more of a traditional design. So really it was just in the Highway <coughs> 9 that we may need to make sure that we refine some of that so you don't end up with all on these buildings that are primarily glass. Yeah. Huge size. Right. So what we need to do is take a, report, a portion of the front facade and, and right. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. I'm done with 39. I'm on 40. There, there is nothing on 40. Nothing on 41. 42. Now we get into a whole new section, and this is all new. And this is a master signage plan, and this. Master signage plan is an administrative permit to establish standards, including size, design, location, for all exterior signs associated with a multi-tenant or multi-building development. Um, and, and the master signage plan shall ensure long-term aesthetic, I'm not going to read this whole thing, so, um, but it shall ensure long-term aesthetic compatibility of signage throughout the development. So it's to coordinate all the signage in a new development. And the goal of the master signage plan is to um, adequately and effectively communicate business identity, to promote consistency, to enhance the compatibility of signs with the architectural and site design, encourage signage that is in character with planned and existing uses, and protect the community from sign clutter and visual blight. Um, if it's, if, in terms of applicability, if it's a new development, um, it's re reviewed as part of the rezoning or um, uh, uh, site plan. Um, if it's um, uh, if, if, it, if it's already developed, well, if, it's, if it's undeveloped and doesn't require zoning, it comes to the Community Development Department. If it requires zoning, it will uh, go to the City Council and you will be re re reviewing the master site plan. Okay? Um, the uh, D, under uh, application requirements, uh, we will be looking for signs, uh, the proposed palette of which is listed, and you'll see 1 through 10, those are all the different types of signs that we'll be looking for a d design, making sure they're all consistent with each other. And it continues on. There's another nine different types of signs on page 43 at the top. That will, and so there's a whole palette of different signs that we're going to be looking for to be included in the sign plan. There, in terms of design guidelines, by sign type, 
And I'll just go through a few of these. We have given vis uh, visual examples of sign types. So, for instance, the bottom under A, on the bottom of page 43, you see entryway signs, and we, we give you some sense of what we're looking for for entryway signs. And if you go through the next several pages, you'll see uh, that for each type of sign, we've given you an example. So the next page on page 44, primary multi-tenant freestanding signs. Again, you'll see some examples. And then that goes all the way through. We different sign, a different uh, uh, type of sign, and we give an example. So you know, secondary multi-tenant, single tenant, a parcel freestanding sign, on and on. And there's 19 different categories here, all of which have Thanks to Angela and her hard work, she's put together examples of signs. So I'm going to just going to move right through that. Pardon me. Yes. Um, I guess would this include also wayfinding? Yes. Signs? Yes. I didn't see anything specifically. It said I see tenant directory. Directory. Well, that's what we. That would be considered yeah. wayfinding. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we go right through. Sandwich boards, temporary freestanding signs, it, it continues on, temporary <clears throat> banners. I'm moving through on page 56 and ending at 56 with all the different types of signs. Now on page 57 and we're talking about prohibited signs. And, the, and again, we're in the master signage plan, but I'll tell you that the, the list of prohibited signs in the master signage plan is the same list that's in the regular ordinance. So there's nothing new here. So that's page 57. Um, when we get to page 58, and these last pages now, all the way through, these were all moved here from other sections and are re revised accordingly by the city attorney. And, and they deal with, um, uh, section 6423-29, violations, penalties, and I see a typo in violations, Angela, right there. Mm -hmm. um, then the next one is suspension, revocation, termination, citation, removal. Uh, and that goes on, and, um, and that's it. So nothing in this section is new, it has just been moved. Yes, well, that's my understanding. Paul, Paul, um, do you want, can you, uh, can I, Councilwoman Thurman just asked a question. Is there nothing, anything new aside from minor tweaks to this? You've moved and collected all these sections over one page it's, for the most part, this is uh, taking from uh, there were various steps which could be taken for various at various different points in the process, depending on whether a permit had been issued, whether a, the structure had been uh, start construction on the sign had already uh, started or had already been completed. Um, what I did was I took each of those various uh, sections and asked the the staff to put them into a single section where someone could see what the result would be and to do more uh, clearly define when each separate step uh, would be uh, implemented. So there's not I, any change I, in policy I, I, here, it's just moving it from one place correct. to another. Correct. Moving it and clarifying when okay. each one of them would, would be appropriate. I, I did, did not add any additional um, or, or remove any penalties or, or uh, results from a violation. We tried, to we tried to get it clarified and make it easier to read and see where it was all in one spot. Joe, thank you. For yeah. Kathleen, under prohibited signs, I mean, obviously, most of these are things that there'd never be a reason to have them, like, you know, obscene signs, illegal signs, that kind of thing. But uh, beacons, searchlights, laser lights, or images, have we contemplated a special permit for temporary use of those things, like grand openings and huh. events and, and some such? I, I only remember talk again fries comes up as the the business that had asked us to allow them to put up some kind of searchlights for their big grand opening and we denied them and they didn't feel very good about that oh. Angela could you respond to that what what the city's um, policy has been toward that um, I don't know what to say other than we've always told people no. Um, I mean, <laughs> when we had that issue come up with, with the carnival, you know, I mean, if you, you can't, that's the thing, if, it, if you open it up to the stores, I don't know that you can limit it 
No, no, no. It, 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 they would have to get a special a permit, right. permit or mm-hmm. something. I don't know, but I mean, but prohibiting them doesn't make a lot of sense to me because there's always going to be some reason you might want to have them, and then if you if there's no way to have them, then you're only avenue of having them is illegal. Well, Paul, if the council wanted to add, you know, a one-time or a grand opening, or can you specify, you know, maybe if it's a new business or whatever, or would that be legal? Can allow, we them to, allow them to have a scrub or a I don't think there's any legal problem with having timing on strobes or, or searchlights or spotlights. Can we, but can we um, limit it to like a grand opening as opposed to, you know, yeah. a carnival? Yeah, have a party or, or yeah. anniversary. Well, or I'm thinking we could put it into a special event permit. And so when they came in for the permit, we could sort of have criteria by, by which we would allow it. And they'd have to get the permit. Well, and would, would council like <coughs> your staff to look at that? Yeah, yeah. yeah for, yeah. A, a, you know, a one or two night thing, I don't think. Yeah, a special, like you said, a special you event permit. An yeah. admin board, right. all of a sudden you realize if somebody's trying to come in every week and right. you, you could deny yeah. Now, this doesn't have anything about inflatable gorillas, inflatable <laughs> fire hydrants. It does. Is that if you want that? Or? <laughs> well, we, we had a problem at one time with a, what was it, about a 30 foot high fire hydrant? Good looking fire hydrant. <laughs> <laughs> fire hydrants, trucks. They attracted every dog yeah. in town. <laughs> But are they, are they not prohibited in this part here, though? Are they inflatable? Are they prohibited based on size and everything else? Um, I guess the, the fire hydrant moves with the wind. But. Well, again, do we do, do we want to have staff a look at inflatables too or not? It, sh- it no, should be in here somewhere. In we, we're just, we just can't find it's it. It's under one. It's on one. Uh, that okay. would be under the air oh, and gas yeah. bill figures. Mm-hmm. Is that what that is? Okay. Balloon streamers or air and gas mm-hmm. okay. okay. It's there. All right. Bill? Uh, number 10, signs not maintained. Was that in the original uh, language? There's a new definition, I believe. I think that was one of the ones I read to you. Uh, 57, number um, 10. Is that just added? I thought that was in our definition, but I don't see it. Yeah, I don't. I don't think that's new. I think we just clarified what that means, definition-wise. But okay. the prohibition isn't new. Okay. One thing I see here is. Uh, uh, compliance with this uh, with this ordinance. We're going to have to bring in uh, extra compliance <laughs> officers to uh, enforce this. Well, I, a I think a lot the, of yeah, a lot of detail that's involved in here. Right, a lot but of you know sure. that helps. The more detail, it's easier for us to administer because it's so spelled out now that there's less room for interpretation. So it is a good thing. Well, who on staff is uh, versed in every uh, line and verse of this? Well, not to diminish anybody's yeah. uh, capabilities. Yeah. But More than I want to. Yeah. <laughs> and, and we do have Paul and Well, that's no You talk about enforcement. We're talking about enforcement. Okay. Okay. Well, let me actually step out there and answer your direct yeah. question. Is this going to require enforcement? The answer is yes. And does that require people to do that? The answer is that's yes as well. Right. Um, you know, there's any of these ordinances that we have on the books take some level of knowledge to know what's being enforced. But, you know, to think that this ordinance all of a sudden just brings people into compliance without enforcement, um, that, that's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, to the extent that we have staff on hand today that deals with code enforcement, um, Yes, we, we have that at our, at our disposal. Are we going to need um, more at some point in the future to continue to maintain adherence with this and other codes that the city has? I think the answer to that's yes. Um, so no, I don't want to shy away from the, the from the concept of how do these things get enforced because it, it does. It, it takes it takes people seeing things and people taking action on what they see um, to make that enforcement. But in all fairness, it's, things are being enforced now. 
and this doesn't necessarily mean there's double the, the workload. Well, I, yeah, number 10 there, uh, failure to maintain signs. I'll bet there's a half a dozen of them on Thompson Road, just one stretch of, uh, of town. Uh, and I see these signs on telephone poles and trees all over the place. continues to be a problem out there. How are we addressing that? Well, signs, if, if you, uh, signs get enforced quite frequently, as a matter of fact. If you uh, were to look in the back bed of any of our public works or, or any of our code enforcement vehicles, you'll see that signs are um, collected quite frequently. I do have to give credit to whoever's going around and spray painting the, the number out of the signs. Yeah, I think that's quite creative. You know, I'm not quite sure who that is, but that was um, awfully nice of them. Um, but uh, well, isn't that something too that we could, you know, some of these that I'm guessing Bill's speaking of on Thompson are, are real estate type signs that that we could, you know, after we've seen that they're not maintained, we could give a list to the to the optic folks or something like that, and they could snatch them down for us versus us having right, somebody out there to, to to do it. Those kind of things. Each sign would be a, a bit different, um, and I don't want to go so far as to say we send optic out there because now we start to deal with the right of way versus private property yeah. stuff okay. and who can enforce and who can take and all that good stuff, which we don't need to get into tonight, but um, I'm probably more comfortable with allowing that to fall within code enforcement's realm than I am public works. But we, we, we do have enforcers out there, yes. And it's something that in the future we can address uh, with staff of how much we want to enforce and how much time and That's right. effort and how much we want to spend doing that. And at some point we'll probably come back and either reaffirm the discussion we had you know, a couple of years ago and either reaffirm it or change our direction as to as to what is believed to be code enforcement's <laughs> role in the city. Because I can sit and, and tell you that, you know, if, if we look at a proactive response in code enforcement and a reactive response or a complaint-driven response in code enforcement, each has its place and you kind of have a strike a delicate balance between what's right for this particular community. I got a sense, if uh, several of you all remember, I got a sense of what that was, what the council's preference was with respect to that a couple of years ago. We might want to look at that again and make sure that we've struck the right balance and that we continue to strike the right balance. But uh, you know, that's a, it's actually a, a pretty productive and healthy discussion to have on, on the role of code enforcement. So, go ahead. Um, a couple of other moving pieces, and I. Again, maybe again, like that educational thing. Uh, we've got a few other things going on, like the LCI study, uh, the form-based zoning in Crabapple. Is all that kind of taking a look at what this document yes, that's says a good question. and, and yes. dovetails yes. into that? It has to be c consistent. Yes. Okay. Yes, we, we will be doing that. Okay. Yeah. Last question for me. Um, I got some feedback last fall from some churches that uh, line um, Francis. Uh, okay, so just on the back side of where Milton is. And um, in fact, we mentioned one of the ladies who's, sure. yeah, uh, is the community director there. And they were very frustrated. They were having a fall festival or something like that. Couldn't put the little two by two signs up because they were being told by the city they're not allowed mm -hmm. yet you know I was there speaking on behalf of the city talking about the great relationship that we have with this uh, this church and I couldn't defend that did we put some language in here that gave us a little more flexibility there I think we went over so many things I, I couldn't remember I think we've got some language in here that might have granted an additional five feet sorry I can't see okay. either uh, you know, unfortunately, some of those signs in the right of way, I mean, we can have the best relationship in the world with somebody, and those are still illegal. Um, so, you know, those signs, even those marker signs, the way it was written was 10, or the right of way plus 10 feet. I think now we have some flexibility to it being 15 feet from that edge of pavement, is what I heard tonight. So, there might have been a little bit more flexibility than what you had last year, but I don't know that it would have accomplished 15 signs in the right of way at the front edge of a church, even, even with these new amendments. Okay. <laughs> okay, can you guys map? One question, and this is only because I've, I've I've been to cities that have done this and lived in cities that have done this as well, and it really adds to the festiveness of, of a community. But say around Christmas time, people will paint windows of different characters and things like that. I've just seen that happen. Um, 
if we talked about that at all about this in here, you know, and, and, and I'm just thinking if maybe there was a permit or special use or something where people could apply for something like that as well. And I'm thinking crab apple at Christmas time, they do stuff like that. That's just all. My, my yeah. initial response to that, or initial <coughs> thoughts would be it would fall within that 20%. Okay. Um, I, I, I know, I just, I was thinking like sometimes they do a snow map which would fall out of that range. And usually you have, um, as soon as you have kids paying them or whatever, it's just kind of a weird We can thing. look at that. If that's something that the council wants us to look at, we can look at that between now and next week. Because I don't think that's covered in this ordinance as it's presented. I, mean, if it, I don't wouldn't mind if it was for a limited time. Right, mm -hmm. right. You know, but it would need to be taken down very quickly. Temporary. Paul, you have a comment? Like my neighborhood's Christmas tree still. You're going to have to come <laughs> to the light, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. You need the bridge here to come up. <laughs> <laughs> you guys might want to sit in the front seat. On you, Paul. Yeah. Can we get a scooter? For the yeah. How about just um, sit in the front seat? I think the way we actually address that, and and of course not having been pouring over the last couple of days, like I might have if I was preparing for tonight's meeting, but um, there is some discretion to, available to the director of community development, or as the new wording now describes it, so it originally said director of community development or now somebody else as designated in such power. And also remember, none of this is without the ability to be heard, again, by anybody with a little bit of a plan, comes before the appropriate body, and all those things can be considered for whatever period of time. So if you don't put a stake in the ground, you've got no measure to judge against, but it can always be heard for consideration uh, to allow sure. some additional discretion. Okay. Okay. Anything else? One last word. Oh, shut up. What's what he said? No, that was Jeff. Okay, go ahead. I, can, I went to a planning commission meeting and watched you all go through some of the. Yeah. I've got to compliment you. Very tedious task. Very sign ordinances are very complicated, and you guys put in a lot of hours uh, in in whole and in committee. I know staff has. I know it was a, a real burning issue with a lot of the businesses here. And I just want to compliment everyone that's been involved in going through this process and really trying to to hear some of the the, the comments and mm -hmm. requests of the business owners and other people in the city. So I just want to compliment you on all this. I second that. Yeah. No, we do. Uh, you guys, uh, especially your committee, is uh, one of the hardest working and puts the most time in. So we appreciate it. Okay. If there's nothing else, we'll uh, adjourn this meeting. Well, motion. <laughs> 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 <laughs>